Hi everyone, welcome to the Car Chat Podcast. I'm Sam Moores and with us today we have Lawrence Whitaker. Hello. Hi Sam, how's it going? Very good, very good. Can you good. tell the listeners a little bit about sort of who you are and what you do? Yes, so um, I am the CEO of Warranty Wise, which uh, is one of the UK's largest car warranty companies. Um, but also, more excitingly, perhaps, I am the owner, the third owner of the Lister Motor Company, which is Britain's oldest racing car company. Cool. Right. Can you, so where did this sort of begin? Because I know your, your journey, yeah, your journey. So um, the Lister journey began back in 2012, 2011, 2012. So my, um, it, it really is a little bit linked to Warranty Wise. So Warranty Wise was a company that was founded by my mother and father. Uh, mm-hmm. I was only 15 at the time, but it was a, a kitchen table discussion yeah. um, about starting uh, this warranty business. And, you know, we, um, my mum came up with the name and my, we had to, a sideboard in the, um, in the, in the kitchen where we, we had a computer and, you know, my job would be to sell warranties after school, uh, at that time for a company called WHA, which was the UK's largest car warranty company. Okay. And as the company grew and it, by 2008, so this is, this is jumping forwards kind of eight years. Um, I took over from my dad as the CEO and my dad retired. Um, now my dad, what he loves to do is restore old cars. So he's, he's done a few, uh, Land Rovers originally, and then he restored a few Bentleys and, uh, and, and a few Rolls Royces. And then he, he finally bought this Lister, which was all in boxes. So a chassis, some boxes of, um, you know, parts and, and wheels and all sorts of bits and pieces, just like, you know, not a complete car at all, just absolutely all in boxes. And, uh, you know, he was so excited about restoring this car. And uh, through that restoration project, it, it obviously became evident very quickly that we needed new parts. Mm-hmm. And, you know, in order to find these new parts, we had to seek out the people responsible for building them in the first place. So that led us to visit quite early on George Lister Engineering. Now, George Lister Engineering was was Brian Lister who started Lister it was his grandfather's business that was started in 1890. And that business remarkably was still going. Um, and it was the only connection we had at that time to, to the list of cars company. So we, we, we went down to see those guys. It had, it, Brian had sold the company in 1986. So it had belonged to his grandfather, then his father, then Brian. Brian had sold the car company and the engineering company to two separate different people. The car company went to Lawrence Pierce, who did all the fantastic things with the Lister Storm and uh, the uh, Le Mans, et cetera. And the, um, the the engineering company went to three partners. And we went down to see the engineering company and they had these this, this, this massive wooden crate. And I mean like the biggest wooden crate you could ever imagine. <laughs> and it was just full of Lister car parts, you know, chassis, bits of, uh, you know, wheels, bits of... Um, uh, uh, like uh, uh, books for making the Dion rear axle. It had a chassis book. It had uh, a jig, sorry, for the chassis. It had a, a body book to make the body. There was all sorts in it. There was pictures rolled up of Margaret Thatcher visiting the factory. <laughs> Loads of old blueprints all covered in dust. Um, and obviously when we saw it all, uh, my, my dad really wanted to buy some hubs at this time for the wheels. And he's like, well, you know, I'd like to buy four hubs. And they were like, well, we can't really sell you four hubs. You know, we'd sell you like 40 because we're, we're, we're an engineering company, you know, we want to build a lot of things. Um, and so that led us on a journey where, you know, we, we asked if we could buy all this stuff. And they said, well, you know, it doesn't really belong to us. It belongs to Lawrence Pierce, who owns the car brand. So that then led us on a journey to seek out Lawrence Pierce. Now, Lawrence Pierce is a, is a really nice guy. And he's, um, he's, uh, but he is passionate about Lister and he wasn't keen to let it go. Um, and, and my dad's quite a passionate person and, and, and they were talking on the phone to each other, Lawrence in Portugal and my dad over in Lancashire for about a year and getting nowhere really. <laughs> and uh, eventually I said to my dad, look, if you, you know, if, we, if we're really serious about buying Lister, I said, we need to go over to Portugal and meet, meet, um, meet Lawrence and, uh, and, and his wife Fiona. Um, and my dad is somebody who doesn't really leave Lancashire. You know, he just stays, uh, he doesn't really go on abroad holidays or anything like that. But uh, we went we went for a whistle stop uh, one night stay in uh, Lisbon, 
met Lawrence and Fiona and, and managed to secure a deal for the Lister Motor Company, which wasn't called the Lister Motor Company then. The, the Lister Motor Company, as, you, as we know it now, we, we created the Lister Motor Company Limited to hold all the other companies, but all the other companies that we bought are all the historically important companies. And what, what's really interesting is, and, and one of the things that I really loved about Lister was that Lister has never been in administration. It's never, you know, gone bump or stopped trading. It's traded consistently since 1954 to the current day. And, and I do not know another small British car company that you could say that about. You know, it's just absolutely incredible. Um, and so that, you know, some of the, the old car companies, uh, the old limited companies like Brian Lister Light Engineering Limited. I mean, that company was founded in 1954. You know, there was there was various old mm. companies um, that have been trading for a very long time, plus all the newer companies that Lawrence Pierce had registered, like Lister Storm Limited and uh, Lister LMP Limited. So we, we combined all these companies under the new umbrella of the Lister Motor Company. And there we, we were in 2013. We'd managed to bring the, the stuff from the engineering factory, the stuff from Lawrence Pierce, bring it all together and uh, we had a, a, a car company, so uh, so yeah, that's that's basically how it came about. Just on a on a lookout for some hubs for this uh, list that my dad was restoring. <laughs> we ended up buying the whole company. So yeah, it was. Uh, and what were they doing just like before you bought them? What were they actually like doing? What that company? You said it was broken down to a few different ones, but like yeah. So I mean, were they making well, cars. They're making mostly support, you know. So um, Lawrence Pierce, he, he finished the um, his Le Mans. I think the, the, the last Le Mans entry for Lister was two thousand and six, and and so since then Lawrence Pierce was just making a few parts and yeah. he was restoring some uh, older storms that he had, um, and he you know it was just 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 ticking over really the business and uh, the the engineering side of the company they were making all sorts i mean they always have george lister engineering has always made a lot of fantastic things i mean they, they made the bridge over the river cam they oh. made the gates at uh, uh, cambridge uh, university at, uh, at queen's college i think it is and um you know so they, they've always made varieties of, of, yeah. of things and, and i think today they're making um, you know they're very very good at making uh, window frames and things like that so they're, they're always yeah, they've yeah, got yeah, their yeah. fingers in lots of different uh, engineering pies really um and that they did something for the olympics with the uh, velodrome for the cyclists so they, they've, they've, they've always traded as well so it was you know which is so nice really um because the, the both companies had, had always done so well and through buying lister of course i got to meet brian lister which was uh really really special because i got to know brian quite well in the last few years of his life and um uh and his you know his journey that he'd been on was was amazing you know i mean he he said to me uh because i obviously i was interested to ask him how did he get around to making yeah. a car so um he asked his dad when he was i think he was 23 and uh he said oh, you know look i want to make a racing car you know archie scott brown was his friend who was a, a you know not a racing driver at the time but amateur racing driver i guess and he said, um, me and Archie want to go racing. And his dad said, well, you can have six months off work and 1,200 pounds. But if you can't make it work in that time, then you've got to come back to work. <laughs> you know." And and, uh, and what Brian achieved in that six months was not only to make a racing car, but a race winning racing car. You know, the list of Tejero Jap that he did with John Tejero, the first car, it was a successful in its, in its, in its class. And, uh, and that led on then to, you know, many variations of different listers right up until 1957, 58, where they made the tie-up with Jaguar and then the Jaguar engine listers, which became incredibly successful yeah. um, in the 50s. Because I, I was looking into, I it's a brand I've sort of come across but didn't know too much about. As in, I've been to like, maybe like Revival or something like that and seen some of the knobblies like cruising around. Um, and then... Probably five years ago, I started going to some of the Peter Auto events, and I came across my first like Lister Storm GT car. I don't know whether, whether it was like GT3 or whatever it was at that point in time. Um, there was a black one that was sort of around, um, which was very cool. And then I then like you do a bit of googling, like oh, there's some road cars, and like, very few, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, how many of those were made? Any idea? So, um, so the Lister Storm road cars is very, very few. I think I think there was I think there was three or four um, Lister Storm road cars. Obviously, the early Nobleys they were pretty much all road cars because at the time there wasn't really a 
difference or a different, you know, between what, what car, what's constituted a race car or a road car. They, they yeah. tend to race them and then drive them home. You know, I mean, there's lots of stories of Archie testing the list of race cars on the A34 at Cambridge, you know, and uh, at night time <laughs> and stuff, trying to get the car um, faster and faster. Um, and uh, Lawrence Pierce made quite a few of the Jaguar conversions, the um, the XGSs, which are called the List of Le Mans. So he made, I think it was about 86 of those altogether. Um, um, but yeah, lo- loads of, you know, loads of variations, but I mean, not not too many cars. I mean, and that's what's, what's kept list of values high, I guess. I mean, now, you know, a, a List of Le Mans, uh, which is basically a souped up XJS, just a uh, picture a, of this. It's a pretty six, cool looking thing. Yeah, six liter or seven liter V twelve. I mean, one of those cars now brings upwards of a hundred thousand pounds, whereas XJS prices are still at kind of twenty and twenty thirty thousand pounds. So, I mean, the list of brand has always held this kind of uh, mystique that that transcends into value. So, an original Nobly now, uh, you know, bringing between one point five and two million pounds. An original list of storm is bringing between seven fifty and two million pounds. So, I mean, the, the the value in the cars for such a small car company. I mean, you know, no no disrespect to other companies, but you know, there's, there there isn't a Bristol that's worth two million pounds. There isn't a TVR that's worth two million pounds. You know, they, <laughs> no, and 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 that's what's so magical about the the race success and the heritage is that it really transcends into the value of the cars. Uh, and I think that's what's kept Lister successful all these years because just like you know the, the, the cars that are successful in the in the in the racing world like ferrari and uh and and and, and bentley and, and all those other brands you know they they're the values of those cars it's it's that magic between a racing car and the brand that, yeah. that really that really helps the brand uh develop in a, a value and therefore you know longevity i think yeah and so when you guys were coming in like putting something together because you wanted four wheels um, and you're like, okay, we want to, let's, let's, you know, buy this company. What was the, the vision and has that changed? You know, what was the reasoning sort of why specifically did you want to, you know, revive well, or bring back? Yeah, or, or there wasn't, own, there wasn't, you know? I suppose there wasn't really a, 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 we weren't looking for this. Um, it was just something that, you know, came our way. I mean, my father and me were both huge car enthusiasts and, and, you know, we, we've, we've always, you know, I mean, I was trained as a, you know, by my dad uh, to be a you know mechanic when I was, you know, 14, 15 years old, you know, changing mm. brakes and uh, fixing cars. And, you know, I bought my first car when I was 15 and it was just a Ford Fiesta, but just to practice on, you know, and, yeah. um, and, uh, you know, basically come, took everything off the car and put it back <laughs> nice. on again, just, just to learn about how to do it. Um, and, and we just had this passion for cars and, and, and we collected cars and we restored cars and, uh, and, it, and it, it's not a, a particular type. It's just any, anything, you know, mm. I think it's, uh, we just love all different types of cars and, uh, are just real enthusiasts. Um, and so if you, if you love cars so much and you're such an enthusiast, then when someone says, oh, wait a minute, you can own your own car company, <laughs> you know, then all of a sudden that is really, really exciting. Yeah. Um, eat without, and I think that's the only kind. That's the only person that would buy a car company because <laughs> if you were uh, if you were weighing it up on a business strategy kind of um, uh, point of view and thinking, you know, I'm going to make loads of money out of this, then then you're, you're probably mistaken. Um, but um, but I, what I'm proud about, I mean, so well, just to talk about the the vision for a second. So the, the first thing we did was um we 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 the, the, the engineering part of, of of lister so george lister engineering um we asked the guys there if they will build us 10 uh recreation lister noblies and that okay. was bef- that was before you know all these jaguar recreations had happened mm. and aston martin recreations lister really started that um, trend to make a recreation um or a continuation as we call it because the chassis numbers ended at bhl 150 so we started bhl 151 which was um the first chassis number that we produced and you know we we, we decided we were going to make 10 list of nobly road cars um after that so 10 race cars first then 10 road cars and when we announced those cars i mean they, they, they sold out within a matter of uh, of weeks you know i mean we really we, wow we, we 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 the first cars we announced were the um uh, list of race cars and we, we charged 250,000 plus VAT, um, which, you know, I thought was, um, you know, 
a big ask to ask yeah. somebody to pay that amount for a car. Um, but then we sold those cars within a matter of weeks. And those cars now, I'm so proud to say, are selling for upwards of £400,000. Um, Brilliant. So, so those customers did really, really well. And that led to the second lot of customers who wanted kind of all different types. Some people want to race a nobly. Some people just want to tootle around Lake Geneva or whatever. And, and yeah. some people just want to collect one. So, I mean, we did the 10 road cars. And then the, the, the best thing that we ever did was just purely by a chance, which was the Lister Sterling Moss, which is the still, the, the, well, it's always going to be the only racing car ever endorsed by Sir Sterling Moss. And just, I mean, that when you, when you think about that, that is yeah. just a miracle beyond loaves and fishes, isn't it? That the fact that we can say that and um, it just happened. So we, how that came about was we were at the uh, Coventry uh, car show, um, race retro. And um, we had, it was the first show we ever did. We did. We haven't, we had, we didn't have a finished car. We had a car, which was a, a body hung above a chassis, mm. a rolling chassis. And, um, you know, we were stood there on the stand selling, you know, talking to people about the cars and, uh, and, uh, and whatnot. And, um, and Sterling Moss was on his little scooter. I'd never met Sterling Moss before. I didn't know him or anything. And, uh, when it, when he came past, he stopped at the Lister stand and he was just so excited to see that Lister was back doing this. And he wasn't even meant to be on our stand. He was going somewhere else. But he stopped. He started talking to us about the Nobly and how much he loved it and how he enjoyed racing it and how it was such a great car to drive. And he was so enthusiastic about yeah. it. And then he then he sat down and started signing because people were coming up to him. And so he started <laughs> signing some books. And then he's, whoever it was, his agent or his manager came running over and said, no, 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 Sterling, you're not meant to be here. You're meant to be <laughs> over there. You know, you're at the wrong place. So he had to quickly get up and go and uh, walk <laughs> over somewhere else and uh, and carry on uh, <laughs> whatever he was getting paid for that day. Um, but then, um, and, and this is just a testament to what a gentleman he was. You know, he, he sent um, sent us a letter saying, would I like to come down uh, for, for lunch with him? And uh, so we went down to see him in London. And, um, you know, he, he, he just said, look, you know, I, I love the Nobly so much. Uh, you know, I want to do something together. You know, and I said to him, that's really, really nice, Sterling. I said, but... You know, I said, obviously, I, I, knew, I knew about the Lister, uh, sorry, the um, McLaren Sterling Moss SLR, um, Mercedes yeah. McLaren Sterling Moss SLR. I said, obviously, he did that tie up with uh, Mercedes McLaren. Um, you know, I, I, I'm not sure we're going to be able to afford <laughs> to pay you what you got paid for that deal. I said, because at the moment, we're just a very small entity and, yeah. and we're, we're, we're running it with our own money. You know, we're just investing in it ourselves. And Sterling just said, listen, he said, you know, he says, I, I've, I've done a, a lot of different things in, in my life. And he says, and I've never, ever endorsed a racing car. He said, but let me tell you, the list of the Nobly, he says, I was so upset because he was asked to race in, I think it was 57 for, for Brian Lister. Brian Lister asked him to race for a full season. But then I mm. think Mercedes came along with a really good offer and he left to go and race for them. And, and Brian was a bit knocked about it. But so was Sterling. You know, he loved the Nobly, and he really, he always had this famous saying, better to lose in a British car than win in a foreign one. But he loved the, um, the, the Nobly, and, and, uh, and, 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 and more than I even knew that he did. You know, he was just, just, just so in love with the car. And so he said to us, look, you know, I, I know you guys are doing it on a, on a shoestring budget. Just whatever you can afford, you know, it doesn't matter what it is, just whatever it is. Um, I just want to be a part of it. Um, so I think we ended up paying him five thousand pounds a car or something uh, ridiculous. Um, but you know he worked so hard for us. You know he, he, we went to we had a big launch at the RAC Club in London. We went to uh, America together to the Pebble Beach show to launch the car in America. And you know he really put the effort into the Lister Sterling mm. Moss. And um, and yeah, so, I mean to say now that we've got the Lister makes the only racing car ever officially endorsed by. So Sterling is really, really special. Yeah, um, that is super cool. Yeah. So, I mean, and, you know, just to put yourself in my shoes for a minute, Sam, you know, I mean, this is someone who, if you own a warranty company and you ring someone like Sterling Moss and say, oh, hello, I own a warranty company. Would you like <laughs> me to come and say hello to you? You know, they're just going to say, no, get lost, aren't they? Whereas this is this is the doors that Lister has opened. So if, you, if you're yeah. a car enthusiast like I am, Lister has opened so many doors in that world where people just wouldn't talk to you otherwise. Mm. Um, 
And I've got to meet so many wonderful people that I would never have got to meet. So, I mean, even though Lister hasn't perhaps been, uh, you know, uh, financially rewarding, it's definitely been rewarding for the soul and, and for, for the, for the, to meet people in all, not just Sterling, obviously, but all different people that I've met over the years that, that love racing and, and Lister. That's very cool. Was that, was that part of the initial attraction as well? Like, uh, no, I don't think I ever really thought about that. <laughs> I didn't think this is going to get me open loads of doors. Um, uh, I certainly didn't, didn't think that, but, um, it's just something that just naturally, naturally yeah, yeah, happened. Yeah. It's a bit like it's the same for me with this podcast. Like I started yeah. it because I like chatting to people and then it was like I chatted to all my friends and then I'd done that and then it was like, right, I've got to reach out to different people. And then I've met so many interesting, cool people over the last, whatever, it's two, three years that yeah. I wouldn't have otherwise met and then also get to drive cars and things, which is which is good fun. But yeah. um Definitely. I've often thought about starting a podcast myself just for the sake of being able to <laughs> talk to people I want to talk <laughs> yeah, to. Yeah. But uh, yeah, no, it is interesting. I, I used to think, well, oh, I need to start a, start a car magazine, then people will lend me a free car for a few weeks. <laughs> it, that's a very good way of doing it. They Less so now, I think, but previously, I know someone that started up a magazine that sold like, I don't know, 500 copies, 300 copies, and he would call up a manufacturer and they would lend him a car. And I was like, what? It's not under, yeah. like, yeah, it's a magazine, but like, it's tiny. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's incredible. I mean, that's, that, that's, I, I'm in that, I, I end up doing that. But what I end up doing is buying the car yeah. to have a go in it. And then I end up selling it if, if I don't like the car and keeping it if I like it. So. I, I, I have this with, uh, with some friends. I, I, for a long time, had like a couple of cars, but I owned them for a really long period of time. And, and then recently I've just started like, I, I, it's, it's gone a bit wrong because I'm like, I sold that and then sold that. And then you're like, but I just kind of want to try lots of different things. Yeah. Um, but definitely being in this position, I'm taking a step back a little bit because mo- a lot of the fun I've personally found is it's like the excitement of finding it, the excitement of like looking for it, trying to work out what you might want, might you don't want, et cetera. And then you eventually, if you do decide to buy it, you get like a week of like, <laughs> and then it slowly like goes down and then there's yeah, possibly a little so, earworm. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's funny, isn't it? I mean, I, I get like little, um, like I get obsessed with a particular car for a while. So uh, I'm over it now pretty much, but I was, I was, I was really obsessed with Rolls Royce coin mm. Uh, and that's, it's a funny thing to be obsessed with. I know, but it's, um, I just, I just, I just think that they are so undervalued. I think that, like, if you look at a, a like a, 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 a two door coupe Mullen Park Ward, for example, that's not a convertible car. I mean, you can. I, I've bought one of those cars recently for twenty eight thousand pounds. You know, and you think to yourself, I mean, that is such an undervalued car when you consider a Rolls Royce Series One, you know, um, Cloud convertible is four hundred grand. There's yeah. something going very wrong that, like, ten years later, that car is like worth twenty eight grand. You know, and I just think that. You know, and the convertibles. Well, so I bought a I bought a coupe Corniche, and I seventy three or something. I loved it. It was driving it every day. I was like, oh my god, I can't believe how good this car is. Yeah. I was researching all the history. The guy uh, who owned it originally in London, he was a builder, and I rang his office. His office is still going, and she says, oh yeah, yeah, Raymond, he's oh, died nice. now, but he used to, he was well known for going to site with his Rolls Royce, and he had his spade in the boot, and he'd get out and start digging in the ground, and and so I, you know, I loved the car even more when I heard all these stories. And then I bought a uh, Corniche convertible because I thought, well, you know, I definitely would prefer the convertible. Another 74 car, I think that was. And I love that car. A really, really great car. It belonged to a local guy who owned a few Balka. As a, it's called Balka BMW, but he owned a few BMW dealerships near mm. me. Um, really cherished car. And, and, uh, and I love that car. And then I thought, oh, I'd really, really like one of the really early, before they were even called Corniches, when they were called Mullen Apart Ward. So I bought right. one of these 1967, very early cars. And then I was like, do you know what I really want? <laughs> <laughs> it's it's the very last Corniche, you know, not the early one, the, the last one with the, you know, everything works properly. Yeah. It's got the air con and everything. So I've, that, now that took some finding. So um i really had to search for that so that's so the core niches they made a core niche one which was pretty much all the core niches up until yeah. 1986 i think and a core niche two was 86 to 88 
Cornish three was maybe it was eighty nine. Cornish three was eighty nine to ninety one, and then a Cornish four, which was that they, they made about four of them or something. Anyway, so I, I managed to find a Cornish three nineteen ninety Cornish three on collecting cars, so I just had to buy it. And the irony is, like, I, I was so excited about that, so excited. I really, 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 really wanted it. And I was like, oh, I'm going to drive this car every day. I just, I'm so excited to get this Corniche 3. And then when I got it back, the, the Corniche from 1974, I actually think drives a bit better. You know? So, like, <laughs> I'm like, oh, so now I've got four Corniches. I've, like, cornered the Corniche market. And I'm, <laughs> and I'm just in a bit of a Corniche, you know, mess now. But... I just think you know. I, I believe that the cars will appreciate, and yeah. you know, if you can, if you can, if you can not lose money on a hobby, I just think how wonderful is that? Yeah, you know? and, brilliant. And yeah, and it's it's just um, I'm in a privileged position that I can I can buy the cars that that I'm passionate about, I guess. And and luckily, I'm not passionate about cars that cost two or three million quid. So you can have yeah, as much yeah, fun yeah. with with ten or twenty grand that you, as, for me anyway that, as you can with these really expensive cars. So, um, but then once now I know that I'm kind of I've I've, I've scratched my core niche itch, yeah. And I'm like I'll be onto something else in a, in a few. What's the next few, itch? I, I haven't got it. I don't know what it is yet. Um, but it's uh, yeah, I don't know. But it'll. Uh, I'm, I'm happy when the itch is being scratched. Really, this is my best time, and I'm not frantically worrying about yeah. how am I going to find the next car. Um, yeah, yeah so I, I just, won't. I won't press you too much on that one then, because otherwise it'll. <laughs> It'll start. And then... <laughs> There's all sorts of cars I would love to have. I mean, I like, I'd, I'd like an SEC Mercedes, like a, yeah. a, five, a 560 SEC. I'd love one of those, a really sorted one. Um, I mean, I, I like the BMW 850s. I mean, luckily I've got an 850 CSI, so I mean, I, I love I love that car. And um, I, I love those kind of 80s big coupes, you know, comfortable cars. I'd love an S600, really, just like a, you know, the Princess Diana style or the W one two four is perhaps the I mean, I'm not sure what the what the code I'm is sure. but the uh, the Princess Diana style S six hundred I would love one of those. Um, there's you know, a there's, lot, there's... a bit like you said, like with the you know the rolls and stuff like that. Is these cars that were so expensive when they were new? Oh, 100 grand, yeah. And then like they're worth like not nothing, but like a lot, lot, lot less for a lot of these cars. Some of them, okay, the tech doesn't work and whatever, but you still like get in them and you're like, this is a nice car. And like if it's a rolls. Everyone that's not a car person will be like, that's a cool classic Rolls. I'm not joking you. If you bought like a 10 grand Silver Spirit, that car, I mean, apart from its drinking fuel, but that car is better in every way than I think, you know, most modern cars. It's, it's <laughs> everything is so comfortable. It's so quiet. You know, it's everything, you know, they've got air con, they've got electric seats, they've got cruise control. You know, they're just incredible. You know, and even the early Cornish is from... 1973 you know they've got air con and electric seats and cruise control and you just think wow you know there's if you had one of those in 1974 50 years ago pretty much cars haven't really got <laughs> that much different yeah. that is not the improvements aren't that much um you know they're a bit quieter and a bit safer and uh, you know but i just i love those kind of old cars that have everything on them <laughs> yeah yeah yeah, yeah. It's there's quite... a, a a doctor where I used to live, um, there was a doctor on our street and his doctor's car was a Corniche 2, maybe, convertible. Nice. And it had like the doctor's badge in it. And, you know, wow. <laughs> and he always used to wear, he was like this super smart looking guy and he always used to wear a bow tie. And whenever he'd like get out to go and do his doctor's business, he'd like walk out the door and he'd always leave the convertible with the roof down, get in his corniche and then like cruise off. And like, that is oh, super cool, this? isn't it? It's super cool. I mean, yeah, that's, yeah, that's, that's, that's how we all wish we looked, I think. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Guys, yeah. yeah um, but... So, right, you acquired list of cars. Mm -hmm. You started doing, you did the continuations. So you made some race cars and some road cars. And then at some point, you're know, like, let's do some some more modern-y stuff. Yeah, I mean, so the the, the reason was, um, I mean, once we'd done the, 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 it's kind of like getting on for, for 30 Nobleys, so, you know, 10 Sterling Moss cars, 10 um, uh, road cars, 10 race cars. We really just had to wait for these cars to be built because, you know, they, they're not quick things to build. I mean, it's taken yeah. us, it's taken us pretty much, you know, seven years to get through those cars and we're, we're, we're not we're not quick at building them um obviously they're very very much handcrafted and the, the workmanship that goes into them is, is second to none 
And unfortunately, they've all been a big lost leader for us. You know, they've not made any money because they've if we've, we've put so much effort into making. I mean, if you ever see one that we've made, so one of the cars we've we've built is is winning at the moment the um, Sterling Moss Trophy, which is the historic race series. Mm. And, and when you look at the quality of the cars, I mean, they are really really good. Um, something I'm so proud of. Um, and then, so I, you know, while I was waiting for these cars to be built, I thought, well, you know, the obviously. Lister and Jaguar, uh, a lot of people, that, that name is each, you know, Lister Jaguar. They, they, when I say to people, I own Lister, they oh, Lister Jaguar, you know, that's what the kind yeah. of response is. They, they, they recognize both names together. And the, the tie-up came about uh, in 1956, when, 56, 57 it was, when the Browns Lane factory burnt down, which was the Jaguar factory, and all the racing cars got um, destroyed. Um, and... Um, William Lyons wanted the Jaguar engine and the Jaguar brand to carry on racing because Jaguar had just been through this mega, mega, mega successful period of winning Le Mans multiple times and uh, the D-type and the C-type. You know, yeah. they, they just blasted everybody. Um, and so he asked um, um, Brian Lister to put a Jaguar engine in his in his car, which at the time uh, Brian was using a Maserati engine. And Brian didn't really want to do it, to be honest. He was he, he was happy with his Maserati engine, and he, he thought it was a good engine. And um, and so, big dudes and little dudes was uh, William Lyons uh, really really wanted this to happen because uh, I think he he saw the potential of a reliable engine like the XK engine and the lightness of the Nobly, um, which wasn't the Nobly at the time, but the, the Lister racing car would you know would be a match made in heaven. And uh, he he got I think it was Shell uh, to give Brian Lister some sponsorship on the proviso that he took the SK engines. <laughs> nice. So, um, so Brian's hand was, you know, he's, it was, uh, was, uh, was twisted a little bit and, um, you know, behind his back and he, and he, and he, and he did the deal. And, um, well, once they put the XK engine in the car, which became the Lister Nobly, that obviously was an incredible car. And that's the, the start of the Jaguar Lister relationship started then. And it really never went away. You know, L- Lawrence Pierce, always used Jaguar V12 engines um, in his cars. Uh, obviously, there were some Chevy engines as well along the way, but Jaguar was definitely the, 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 the domineering uh, company that they, they looked to for their engines and the, and the powertrains. Um, and, and Lawrence Pierce had been so successful with the Lister XJSs, you know, that I just thought, well, there's got to be uh, a market for doing a Lister Jaguar again, you know, a, a taking a Jaguar and just like what Alpina do to BMW and just like what Brabus do to Mercedes, you know, taking a, a Jaguar vehicle and kind of enhancing everything about it. So we started that process in 2015 or 2016 with the uh, F-Type. And, um, you know, it's just, well, I bought two F-Types. We started taking the cars apart in our workshop and just started looking at everything and how it was bit built and what we could do better and and we ended up, you know, pretty completely rebuilding the car. So, so our Lister um, LFTs, as they're called, I mean, they have complete new suspension. They have complete new exhaust systems. They have uh, the lowered. Um, they have got a carbon fiber body kit, so new carbon fiber bumper, uh, rear splitter, side skirts, wheel arch extensions, full new leather interior, leather roof lining, leather seats, leather, you know, all hand stitched, all a bridge of wear the finest leather you can buy. I mean, the interiors are just beautiful. Um, and the engine was the final piece, which we we, we, we managed to tune the uh, V8 Jaguar engine up to 666 brake horsepower. And what we were left with was a car that was extremely, extremely fast. And and I think, I'm, you know, I'm, not, I'm, I'm biased, but I think it just looks so beautiful. I love the look of the body kit that we produced for the... I, I was very cautious because... No offense to, to people like uh, Mansori or anyone like that, but, <laughs> but when when a lot of these people make aftermarket kits, I always think they look a bit worse than the original car. And and yeah. and what I wanted was an OEM style finish that was you know it, it had to look beautiful. You know, for me, Lister has always been about beauty. The Nobby is a beautiful car. The Costin's a beautiful car. You know, everything's got to got to look. Um, you know, just right. And and I was mm. so passionate about that. And, and we went through a lot of different revisions for the way that the F- F-Type was going to look. And the car we ended up with, uh, which was the final finished car, we did a prototype car, which which looked a bit different, but then we did the final car. I'm just just so happy with it. I think it looks great. And, and, and we ended up, you know, 
doing quite a lot of those. You know, we 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 charged one hundred and fifty five thousand for the full finished car, and to my amazement, they were really really popular. But the car was we, the not sixty times were down to three point two seconds. The top speed was up to two hundred and I think it was five or two hundred eight miles an hour at the time. And uh, and that started this this uh, obviously re restarted I guess the the Lister Jaguar relationship in, yeah. in tuning. Uh, we're not in, we're not officially endorsed by Jaguar in any which way, but you know, but by doing the the kits on the Jaguar again, it sparked a lot of people's interest. So a lot of people would come to us and say, "Oh, look, I've got an XC, or I've got an XJ, I've got an XK. You know, could you do something to my car?" And, and mm. so we. But so we do a, a lot of a lot of tuning. We do a lot of uh, some people just want a little bit like the wheels, or they just want to tune. Or um, and so we, we, you know, if people let's say they want an engine tune up to the six hundred and sixty six brake horsepower, or they can have a lesser one at six hundred brake horsepower, we'll give them a, a list of plaque and a, and a certificate, and 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 we'll we'll put a warranty on the car, of course, as well. And um, you know, it, it's a really a uh, nice part of the business where we can, you know, we, we, which we're actually really busy at as well. So then we started doing the four by fours, which is the uh, F pace. So when Jaguar brought out the F pace uh, V8, we just thought, well, we've got to, you know, do this car, and um, and uh, and that's that's been more successful than the F type. Um, we, we charge a little bit less for those. I think they were about one one forty, um, and then we ended up with a car that was more horsepower than a Urus, lighter than a Urus. And, you know, it, for, for 140 grand, you know, where a Eurus was 200 grand. So, I mean, yeah. it was it, it, it was just a no-brainer to a lot of people that this was a way of getting. And also that that kind of person that was buying a Range Rover Sport SVR that, and that brand was getting a little bit tainted with the sort of people that were buying that car. Yeah. The connoisseur's choice ended up being the Lister SVR because it was a talking point. It was something unique. Uh, it was really, really fast. You know, I mean... Um, you know, we, we we Auto Trader did a uh, a test against the Urus and, and and we beat the Urus. The, the problem with the the our cars is we Jaguar didn't install launch control. Okay. So if you set off, if you both set off without launch control uh, against the Urus, we always win. Whereas if the and if we we always win at fifty to fifty onwards or whatever it is, uh, you know, when you're doing fifty miles yeah. an hour and then you set off, we always beat them that. But if the Urus uses launch control. And the driver doesn't keep his left foot on the brake when they set off, then we we, we, we lose a little, by about a length of a car. So the launch control is quite important. But in the real yeah, world, yeah. who's who's there at the lights <laughs> putting launch control on? You know, so yeah, I've, SUV. <laughs> I've got cars with it, and I've never ever used it. So uh, so I think it's uh, I, you know, I, I think for the for the for the fact that we're a small car company and we've we've been able to produce something like that that that's so quick quick I'm, I'm i'm really pleased with the with the results and and, and i think the 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 lfp the fdf pace um uh, list that we do i think it looks stunning as well um we were a bit more restricted on the body kit because of the so many sensors behind the bumpers for okay. things like radar and you know reverse sensors and then there's the reverse like side sensor and there's all different bits and pieces you, you can't believe what the, what the, uh, the and obviously then you've got the forward alert so there's, there's lots to think about with these kits now it's not just as simple as uh, making a, a bumper and stick it on a car like it used to be there's quite a lot to it and um, but you know we, we got the weight down significantly we got the power up we got the um, the car breathing better with the uh, the intakes and and and, 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 and you know yes yeah, I mean if you ever um, ever have the chance to drive a, a Lister uh, LFP they're, they're I, you know one of the best cars I think if, if the fastest cars going from A to B of, of, of anything you know it's, it's, a, it's a nice easy car to drive and it's got lots of power in the four-wheel drive system it's 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 a great match yeah it's sort of like super fast SUVs have kind of become the supercar of like 10 years ago almost like yeah everyone's like well I could cruise around this big vehicle that's comfy and practical like you can actually put other people in it and luggage but also have big engine and whatnot and make lots of noise and they handle a lot better than they ever used to i mean you know when you drive a range Rover classic i mean bloody hell you know, you, <laughs> yeah. you know they, they, they handle terribly don't they but like modern range Rover sports are, are, are pretty good and uh and, and and we've got to a point in in all car manufacturing where cars they, they can't go any faster you know when we're already yeah. once you once you're talking about not 60 in two seconds it's, it's gonna you know it's, it's pretty impossible to get any faster isn't it and and, and if you could go to not 60 in one second who's going to want to go that fast because it's painful isn't it you know if yeah. you could 
go on Rita, Queen of Speed at Alton Towers, you see how painful it is. You know, it's not a uh, enjoyable experience. So, you know, and and the problem with cars like that is, and this is my just a personal pet peeve, really. But if you, it's probably an unpopular, um, um, you know, opinion. But um, I love a car that you can drive confidently, you know, and and, and spiritedly, and and you feel that you're using the car's power. And a lot of cars these days, I think modern modern uh, supercars, there's just so much power. Yeah. You can't ever get to the top of the rev range. You know, the car is too fast. And especially for the roads in Britain, you know, country lanes and stuff, the 60 mile an hour limit cars. If you, you know, you're at 60 in first gear at 5,000 revs. Yeah. So, you know, where, where are you going to go? And sometimes when you, if you, if you just take like something like a Porsche Boxster S, you know, a manual Porsche Boxster S and take it on a country lane, there's, there's you can't have any more fun. You yeah, know, and, and and I think that's the that's the kind of the problem with with really fast modern supercars. But you know the, the cars that we've produced at Lister, they've they've got usable power. You know, there's, there's the four wheel drive system, which I think is essential really on a car with over 500 brake horsepower. You know, it's I mean Tiffany Dell disagrees with me, but I just think like you know <laughs> he he just loves the rear wheel drive power. But I just think that in the real world, it's raining 260 days a year in this country. You know, I mean, <laughs> yeah, you know. How can four wheel drive not be a good thing, especially over five hundred brake horsepower? But anyway, yeah, it's yeah. I think it depends, doesn't it? Really, but um, yeah, definitely with like six hundred and whatever. If you if you want to remotely put that down, but yeah, your, your point about the gearing and things like that, like being able to like actually run through gears, at like to the limiter, pull another one to the limiter, like. You can't. There's so, you can't really do that in many cars nowadays because no, they're no. All, they're all geared really high as well. Yeah, yeah. No, it's true. And, and you know, they, 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 I suppose they're geared for the for the stats on the piece of paper, aren't they? I guess. And, uh, or, and or emissions. Yeah, emissions. As well. That's true. That's true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, the future is not going to be car friendly, is it? I don't think, um, or performance car friendly. So but, we're uh, then. Well, actually, specifically, your sort of tie in with Jaguar at the moment. Jaguar are saying they're going to go full EV. Are you going to make some some tuned EVs or unknown? I mean, the problem with EVs is it's very difficult to do anything apart from a body kit. You know, you, there's not yeah. a lot you can do to tune an EV. Um, you know, and, and and modern manufacturers are, you know, they they, they aren't um, the friend of the tuner. So you know, there's um, they will be doing everything they can, I'm sure, to lock in. Um, the changes that you might be able to make to make sure that you you can't change them. But um, um, I don't know. I, I find I, personally, I don't think the future is electric vehicles. I think we're probably heading towards a, a hydrogen future, much more is much more likely. I think as at the minute, the only people I really know who are buying electric cars is because you're getting a hundred percent tax write off of it in, in your business, <laughs> and you know you don't have to pay any company car tax. So I mean, that's what's keeping them going. And I mean, I, I bought a Jaguar um, electric car just to see what it was like myself. And I found it less convenient than a petrol car. And I think until it's more convenient, I don't think people will change. You know, mm. the reason we're not all riding horses is because cars are miles better than horses, aren't we? Yeah. But like the thing is, electric cars are a bit worse than a petrol car, you know, in everything apart from perhaps cost. And bloody hell, the cost isn't going to be much of a difference in the, in the future, is it, with the electricity prices going up the way they're going up? Yeah. And the government will find a way to tax them. And I just think that, you know, if the if you can't get an extra three or four hundred miles in three minutes like you can at the petrol station, it's it's definitely worse than what we've currently got. And the only time I can think of what we ever went backwards with was with Concord. Um, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and there's not a single part of humans that like going backwards. And I just think that you know nobody is going to. Unless they make an electric car that you really can get 500 miles range out of, um, well, you know, in a short period of time. Do you think? Then, what about the counterpoint to that? So, like, so I have a, a Peugeot E208 that I use around town and shorter journeys, like sub 150 miles. Um, and I love the fact that I it's charged at home, and I never go to a petrol station. And it's always fully charged, like if I want it to be. Um, and and they sort of eat. There's certain EV specific traits, like you can warm it up before you get in it. I can do that it with my Range Rover. <laughs> yeah, but like, and there's sort of you know environmental 
emissions and whatever and that sort of stuff. Um, I, I personally, for that car, for like short journeys and around town and whatever, it's. I think it's very. I think the electric powertrain works very well. It doesn't require warming up. You don't have to wait for the fluids to warm up before you can give it full beans. So what you're all saying all is we all, we all have to buy two cars now, one for the town and one for long distances. That's, yeah, so, so, if so how is that going to be journeys. environmentally friendly? <laughs> <laughs> but I think, I, listen, I, I do not see what's wrong with a hybrid car where you can turn, I, I 100% agree with you that city centres should not be polluted with you know emissions. And you know if you... You know, we've all been in London where the black cabs are smoking like mad. Yeah. I mean, those cars should just not be on the road. Um, you know, but the the a car that you can that you don't need to charge up that charges itself up when you go down a hill or you break or whatever that you can just switch to full electric mode that can give you thirty miles so that you can nip into town, go around town with your complete EV mode on, and then leave. Um, you know, for me, I just think that is so much um, you know more convenient. Um, than than a full uh, yeah. electric car. I mean, the problem I found with electric cars is, so you know, you it, it'd be raining, so you'd think, oh god, I can't be bothered plugging it in, and you know, I'm going to get wet if I have to get out of the car and plug it in. I just want to run inside the house, and then sometimes you'd be like, so if you haven't got a garage, that's a big problem, isn't it? Yeah. If you haven't got a driveway, that's a big problem. What what are the 15 million people who live in terrace houses going to do? Have like leads across no. the pavement? I mean, how many? claims are we going to be paying for people falling over you know <laughs> and then you know you've got the problem i always get in it every morning i'd forget to unplug it and i'd be like bloody hell i forgot to unplug the damn car now i've got to get out again and unplug it and you know then i'd be thinking like you know it's um if i was always hang, I, I, I go to liverpool quite a few times which is about an hour and 20 minutes from my house and i always used to think like, oh, a bit of anxiety. Am I going to get to Liverpool on time? Yeah, so yeah, yeah. I wouldn't put my heated seats on on my heated steering wheel when I was going to Liverpool because I wouldn't want to stop and charge it up. So then yeah. I'm like, I've not got warm hands. I've not got a warm bum. I'm not going. To, <laughs> I'm not getting the things I want out of this car. And I just, and then you know, my partner would use it and then not plug it in. So when I got to it the next morning, it was flat. <laughs> um, there's just so many things I didn't like about it. Uh, so many things. I mean, I think as a vehicle, they're pretty good. You know, driving one around, you know, the like you say, all the good things about them, they don't need warming up, they're, they're quick, the handling's good because the center of gravity's low. Um, there's a lot of good things to like about them, but I just do not believe that the future is plugging them in. The future's either got to be an electric car that's hydrogen powered or a hybrid car, which is a very, very, very small petrol engine that, you know, 500 cc's or something uh, attached to a, to a battery. But again, that you don't need to plug in. You know, Lexus are already making a car that does, you know, 30 miles on, with, you know, with no plug. I just don't see why yeah. that isn't so much better than it's, having to plug think, your car in and then all the wires, I mean, you lose your wire and then BMW charge you three grand for a new wire, don't they? And, you know, <laughs> and then, then someone will change the plug and then you get to the place and the charging point's broken and then, you know, it doesn't accept your credit card and, Oh, I don't know. It just seems so flawed at the moment, in my opinion. I think, yeah, at the moment, it's definitely not right for everyone and it's definitely not necessarily the best solution. But I think I think give it time to, for a lot of people. If you're not doing if you're doing high mileage, absolutely no way. Now there will be people that say, yes, I have a Tesla and I use it and it's fine, whatever, fine. Okay. But for most EVs you can buy. If you want to do lots of mileage, it's not ideal. So um, in my in my uh, warranty business, I'm lucky that I, I have access to all the reliability data for oh, okay. all the cars yes, that we cover, and, and uh, you know we have uh, we've covered over a million cars, and we've got more more data than anybody really. I mean, there's this. Yeah. We, we, I mean, when you look at JD Power and people like which and the, the, the review cars, they usually have a a data set of seventy thousand vehicles. Well. You know, we, we, we've, we've got hundreds and hundreds of thousands of vehicles in our data set, or perhaps over a million. Um, and Tesla is in the bottom 10 worst claiming cars of last year. What are, what's a typical claim? Well, they're all, like- the, the problem with Teslas is the, the, obviously they're all electrical claims, of course, but, uh, yeah. you know, the, 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 and the problem with all EVs at the moment is, you're forced to take them back to the main dealer. So there are, there are yeah. no specialists that have, that have opened. You know, the manufacturers won't even release the, the, the way to, you know, obviously the computers that you have to plug them into 
they won't release the software so you can so independents can fix them so mm. if you choose a used electric car then you you, you know I'm not saying that all uh, they're, they're all as bad as Teslas. I mean, the Nissan Leafs are actually quite reliable, but the, you know the the, Nis- the the Teslas in particular, we have a lot of claims coming through for those cars, and now it's they're, they're much more expensive to put on risk as a as a as a warranty co- uh, cover okay. than they are than the E Class Mercedes, and so you know it's I just feel like the and you know the the the, the 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 best way to I, I think the, the the way of the future where you know if if we are going to get something that it replaces ice cars it's got to be a solution that is suitable for all and is 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 easier or as easy as the current cars that we have um, and I think until that happens I think you'll and and obviously if you if you ignore all the government grants and everything and the and the uh, the company car tax. I mean, my accountant basically looks me in the eye and says, you need to buy a, a, an electric yeah. car. This is amazing. You know, what the government is doing for you is amazing. You need to get one, you know, and and I, and I don't because, you know, I still have all the reasons I've just pointed out. But if that stopped, would electric cars be as popular? Uh, you know, and, and the answer is definitely no, isn't it? Then you definitely wouldn't see as many Taycan Turbo S's driving around. <laughs> like, well, you know, and that that is a joke, isn't it? Because a, a Taycan S hundred and fifty grand, the new Rolls Royce Spectre three hundred and fifty grand, they're a hundred percent tax write offable. Yeah. So anyone with a business can buy one of those, pay less tax. I mean, how is that? Yeah. How is that good? You know, it's and and I don't know. I just I just think you've got the um, you've got a lot of um, <laughs> emissions is one thing that comes out the end the, the, the exhaust tailpipe of your car. But the, the cost of mining the lithium and the cost of manufacturing new cars is so great that you know people aren't taking that into consideration. The and and the, the worrying thing is the rising prices of uh, electric and you know how is that going to affect our home lives? We're all going to end up paying more in the long run, aren't we? When this the, the, you know we, 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 electric starts getting taxed, maybe we we could you know <laughs> I'm just the, I'm just playing devil's advocate, but no, you know, I, I, know, just, I, know. I just I just think that, you know, my, my personal opinion is I think that the, the, the solution is probably an electric car that's hydrogen powered. You can get your hydrogen from the petrol station. The, the governments will like it because you can tax it. BP Euro garages love it because you can get it from the petrol station. Mars Bar love it because you buy a Mars Bar while you're there. <laughs> you know, Spa and Subway aren't going to go out of business. And, you know, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's something that fits everybody. And, and, and the 15 million people in this country who live in a terrace house don't have to have a wire across from their window yeah. to the car do they yeah it's 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 an interesting i, I think we're going to end up with a it's, it's like a multi-pronged situation not not one solution at the moment everyone just gets a petrol or diesel depending on which flavor of the month it is and then like that's fine but i think moving forward we're going to have this this blend and hopefully some sort of synthetic fuels for us petrol heads to run our crazy old stuff um by then um, it could it could be a new car now, but it is it really interesting. Sort of keep... You know, it's really really interesting the future and 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 what's how it's going. I mean, not just cars, but our homes. You know, how we're going to heat our homes and mm. you know renewable energy sources. I mean, I think it's I, I I am totally pro you know renewable energy. You know, if 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 um you know if you can if you know wave power and things like that, wind power. I think there's the, we've got obviously we're, as an island nation. Um, mm. Uh, Brunel came up with a wave power solution, which would which was incredible. You know, they only ever built one, but it was only mm. a small model. But that that really could work. You know, and, and the stats are you only have to harness twelve miles of wave power along the coast to power the whole country. And surely that's something that is much more urgent than than you know, especially with the Russia problem than than uh, than powering our cars off. off, off. Yeah, it's. Uh, I think those. I'm. I'm interested in all, in all those sorts of things i think someone was explaining the costs of doing stuff and it was like if you do it on land let's just say it's x if you do it on the sea it's like 10x if you try and do it under the sea it's like 100x um because <laughs> of like the materials and how battered and whatnot and I, I saw the other day that like we're starting to get steps forward in um in fusion energy mm. Mm. which like if we can get fusion nuclear power plants like that's it 
Job well, done. if you look at the, I mean, everyone's frightened of nuclear power, but, you know, if you look at how many deaths nuclear power has resulted in, it's very, very small. But people, you know, they see something like Chernobyl and, the, and they are completely frightened of it. Whereas you look at how many people have been killed by coal. I mean, it's like millions, isn't it? Yeah, but people, every year. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but people trust coal for some reason. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm pro nuclear power. I think, I think it would be a good way of us to, you know, um, to power the country in a, in a nice clean way. Um, I mean, Bill Gates has come up with a way to, yeah. um, get rid of the, uh, the used uranium and give us even more power, which I think is fantastic. And surely these sort of things are, you know, have, have got to be, have got to be the way forwards. Um, I just listen, I, and I'm not against clean energy, and I don't, don't, I don't want to come across as somebody who's like this petrol head who doesn't want petrol to die. I'm not. I just do not believe that you know a, a plug-in electric car is the way that we're all going to be driving around in the next sort of ten years' time. Uh, yeah, I I slightly disagree. I think for most people, it's a very good solution and if when we you can... say most people you mean everybody who's got a driveway true yeah yeah, yeah. And, so, and, and that's well, only maybe, half that's half the nation maybe in well okay where i am they're converting all of the lampposts to charging points and is there a lamppost for outside every front door along your no, street there isn't <laughs> but like you know these sorts of things but i i totally agree at the moment if you don't have a driveway slash you can plug in at your house it's it's i would i personally would not do it um i've got a friend that runs a model three and he can't charge like from his house um and he's, he's like completely fine so i think it's when it when you've got the range situation if you've got yeah exactly if you if let's say the inventor car is a, a, a thousand miles let's say for a charge then you might be okay you might just need to charge it once a week at the or well once a month even you know i mean that could be a really good solution wouldn't it you know if, if their if the ranges can improve um you know it, it, it's it, that that would be a good solution but i think while the ranges are still hovering around the 250 kind of um you know i, I just think that is a bit too short a distance yeah um and I mean, it's too I, variable yeah it's very variable on cold days and, and obviously they probably work great in california if it's if it's warm all the time and i think this new eqs is interesting with the with the higher range um mm. you know 400 miles is it or something and and you know I mean, I, it'd be interesting to see how how good that is i mean I, i'd be someone who might buy an eqs um or if, if, if range rover could make an electric car or something like that i'd, I'd be up for something like that but you know it, it's um it's still, you know, I, I still think that the, the the future is yet to be decided on. Totally. And, and when you look at people like JLR, you know, they are they aren't putting energy into EVs; they're putting energy into hydrogen. You know, so I mean, it's. Um, I think there's there is there is a, a beginning to be a shift with the manufacturers who are investing more in research in hydrogen power than you know perhaps the um they are you know looking into ev power but you know it's all interesting it's all i'm looking forward to whatever it is that, that comes yeah. along and um it's uh it's all interesting isn't it and but i think as far as lister goes it's you know it, it's a tough one i mean you know we, we we are making a car like a nobly is you know it's still a it's still a massive undertaking for a small company it's not a it's not an easy thing to do to make any car you know any anyone who makes cars like morgan or janetta or or else you know it's it's not a it's not an easy task and even if you look at someone like aston martin you know they've had to get mercedes you know help really yeah. in terms of um you know uh, finding a manufacturer, manufacturing partner who, and that's, I suppose, with Morgan as well, with BMW, you know, they've, they've found manufacturers who will support them with engines and gearboxes and switch gear. And because the the, 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 the complexities of, of building a car are, 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 are vast and there isn't really anybody who builds a, a standalone car with the very, very few exceptions that doesn't have some sort of larger manufacturer support. I mean, even yeah. Garni and Cohn and Zeg both rely on mercedes support as well and you know for us you know i think the in order to make a brand new car you would really have to find a manufacturer that would give you some some support and obviously that for us would be jlr um but i mean even them they're they're moving to bmw for their support because it, it takes these these huge companies like mercedes and bmw and volkswagen group you know they they are they, they need the volume in order to make it yeah. work 
And even companies like Aston Martin and JLR are struggling to make it work with their own engines and their own design because, because of just the volumes that they sell. So it's not looking great for manufacturers who make a standalone car, I don't think. Unless you make, you know, I, I really love the Ariel company because they, 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 they keep it really simple. Yeah. You know, they'll use a Honda engine and they'll, uh, you know, the car is minimalist. Um, which is great. But, you know, if you want to make a car which is going to compete with something, let's say Lister came out with a new Storm and you wanted it to compete with a Pagani, Hawara or whatever, you know, the, then that is really a £100 million investment that needs to be made to make yeah. that a possibility. So that's not something I can afford to do on, on, on my own. And, and so it would have to be a joint venture. And And I'm just, you know, I'm just conscious of, you know, I don't want to do anything crap you know i think it's got to be yeah, yeah. brian lister said to me you know you said I, I want you to take really good care of the lister car company you know it's it's something that i'm you know passionate about and i don't want you to make a, a you know <laughs> kind of do anything that i wouldn't do and so i am i am conscious of that and, and i think we've just got to step very carefully but as it goes now i mean we've got we're busy building our uh, costings we're building the last sterling moss cars uh we're busy doing the jaguar conversions um, so we're, 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 we're fairly busy at the moment without having to worry too much about what we're going to mm. do next. Um, but I think it's, uh, the, the answer is we've got to think really carefully and do some that we can, that we can do that's sustainable and that, that, and that the people who love Lister are going to look going to like, you know, I think that's the most important thing. Yeah. 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 Something that resonates with the existing. But I have thought about an EV nobly. I've thought about that before, you know, because I think, I think some, some how, EV cars for a weekend blasting classic car actually do make a lot of sense, I suppose, apart from the noise that you lose. But like, you know, you, you, it, most people don't drive a classic car further than kind of a hundred miles. Yeah. They, they can leave it on charge all week, getting it at the weekend, blast around on a sunny day, come back and, and put it back on charge. And it, it does kind of make sense for them. But um, yeah, it's, it, it's just a case of, you know, it, we, we, we're not a company that's got focus groups or anything. You know, it's kind of what I think is going to be right is what we do. <laughs> I yeah. think we just, um, you know, we just got, if, if we make 10 EV nobles and let's say that costs us £5 million to produce those cars, you know, is it going to be something that is, is going to be a success that we'll sell lots of? You know, it's you've just got to be a little bit careful that you don't do anything too drastic um, because, you know, Lister is self-supported. It's, it's got you know no debts it has no bank borrowings it's 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 a company that supports itself now and and, and i'm pleased to say that we've been in profit for three years and and that's the way I, I would like to keep it what have been some of the sort of challenges along the way maybe some unexpected ones mm. or things you hadn't foreseen I'm, I'm the sort of person that doesn't really dwell on things like that to be honest yeah, yeah. you know I, i'm i'm not somebody who has regrets or or gets bogged down I, I love a problem you know so i probably think of problems as something oh great let's 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 sort this out um so i'm I, i'm i'm not quite sure i mean so there's been some some legal challenges and stuff that we've we've, we've had to deal with you know with, with with trademarks and whatnot that people have thought that they own something that they didn't or um, you know, some people, you know, you know, we, we, we solved all those, um, you know, favorably and, um, you know, so, I mean, there's, there's, there's not never been any huge problem, obviously building a car from scratch is a huge problem anyway. So, I mean, every, <laughs> everything's a problem, but you know, in, in the scheme of things, nothing, I mean, I, we've just been so lucky like, whenever we've released a car, one thing that always amazes me is how wide the, the, the spread of, uh, of press release goes. So you really, when we released the press release for the Nobly, let's say, for example, you know, that, that went worldwide, you know, we had inquiries from America, Canada, Belgium, France, we had, we had, we had inquiries from Hiroshima, you know, we had, we had inquiries, you know, from, um, from Russia, you know, from, from all over the place, you know, the, and, 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 co and countries that you just think, well, how do these people even know about this? You know, but they, I mean, Australia is a really you know a good place for listers, and New Zealand is, and it, it, it's quite incredible how widespread the the brand is. Um, so you know, I mean, I suppose the problems that we've had are, are typical manufacturing problems. You know, obviously now materials are getting more expensive, labor's getting more expensive. It's hard to find people with the skills that we need. You know, we we, we brought people out of retirement who were in their eighties and nineties who helped build the original listers to train our apprentices up. So I mean. You know, we, we got over that in, in that way. Um, but yeah, I mean, the, 
running a car company throws up a problem a, a day, really. So it's uh, it's uh, it's hard to just to pick uh, a big one. But there hasn't really been any any, any massive issues. Um, it, it, it's just if you love cars, it, it's a joy, not a you know not not stress really. Mm. So it's, it's something that I. Um, I, I look forward to and, and, and um, you know, but you, of course you get all those normal problems that any business has, you know, a, a customer says they'll buy a car and then doesn't buy one or they can't get the funding or whatever it is, you know, just day-to-day problems of running a business. But, um, but yeah, I mean, last week we had a guy come into the showroom and he bought three Liston Oblies, uh just, just when he walked in, you know I mean? So nice. he says, you know, he's, he sold his business and he, and he just said, um, I'm really interested in the list of Nobly. So I was telling him about what the options were, and we had we had three cars in the showroom. And he said, "Well, he said I'll I'll, I'll order a new one, and I'll take two in the showroom." And I said, <laughs> are, are, "Are you sure?" <laughs> you know, but he said, "Yeah, yeah, I really love them." You know, and and so you know, you, you never know what's going to happen from day to day, and and uh, it's um, you know, it, it, that's the the magic of of running a, a small car company, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, that's fun. Was that uh, was that like a they're they're living on different continents or something? No, or were they uh, literally just going to be at home? Yeah, he, he wants to race one. Okay, he wants to use one for the road, and yeah. he wants to put one away in cotton wool and just never touch it. You know, until, Fair enough. until the day he dies. So yeah, he's uh, three different reasons why he wanted three, but. Uh, yeah, I mean, even I was surprised at that. You know, I think it's, uh, you know, the only other person with three nobles is me, I guess. And, <laughs> <laughs> and um, but I mean, the remarkable thing about the nobly is how good it still drives. You know, if you drive a nobly around the road, it's, it's comfortable. You know, it's, it, it, it's it, they're obviously they're quick, they're really, really quick. But yeah, I mean, they they are they are actually a, a comfortable place to be. If a little bit cramped, if you're on the bigger side, but mm. um, the costing solves that problem. But uh, but yeah, no, I think they there's there's, a, there's a, still a, a lot of love for them, and they still drive in a really good fashion. And uh, and uh, and they're still. I mean, when you think about a Nobly is as fast as an, an Audi R8 <laughs> now. That, that's that's incredible, isn't it? From 1957, a car that does 0 to 60 in 4.2 seconds and 180 yeah. miles an hour top speed. I mean, you've got 400 brake horsepower in a car that weighs 800 kilos. I mean, those stats in the 1950s. I mean, these guys were crazy. The guys that were racing the cars. So, and obviously, it cost Archie Scott Brown his life in the end. So, yeah, it's 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 mad when you come across. Like, I, I don't know too much about just generally older cars. My knowledge is expanding as time goes on and i meet more people and get told more stories and whatever but um yeah looking back at some of these cars from that era and, and before they're like they worked out how to put power in <laughs> well they didn't quite work the rest out but they were like well we can start putting power in these things and they were Bri- fast brian, brian lister was always very much about you know that famous kind of i think colin chapman coined the phrase add lightness you know yeah. and and brian before colin chapman brian lister was the champion of that you know he really wanted to make the car as light as possible so when you look at a jaguar d-type which was perhaps weighing 1.1 1.2 tons and a list of Nobly that was weighing 800 kilos you know it was it, the cars are similar sizes but but brian was just obsessed with saving weight everywhere he could so putting holes in things and you know holes in the chassis or whatever he yeah. could do to make it uh, you know a lighter chassis and, and and lighter body panels magnesium body 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 panels smaller oil tanks smaller fuel tanks you know and anything he could think of to save weight and um that's what he did so i mean if, if i think if archie hadn't have died brian would have gone on to have more and more success i think he was just halted by the fact that his racing driver who was also his best friend mm had died and uh and and that was the end of, of of the business for him as far as he was concerned yeah fair enough have you sort of been tracking where all the cars are like, yeah so that's one of the first things we did really we, uh, we we built up a network of who owns what car and where are they and we started sanctioning some cars that were not uh, original and uh you know people were trying to pass them off as original i mean we when we bought listed there was a guy who you know he was building four noblis from scratch you know like you know, pretending they were listers but you know so there was there was quite a lot of work we did to make sure that we knew which cars were original which cars weren't that was important for us but it was also important important for the auction companies and for, and for the value of yeah, the cars yeah, yeah. um so yeah we did a, we did a lot of all that work at the very beginning just to track down each car and, and make sure we knew who owned it and where it was and, is that uh, is that quite hard to sort of 
Not with a company like Lister, I guess, when there's so few cars. I, th- I think it would be hard if you had uh, you know, a lot of cars. But, uh, you know, Lister, Lister has probably made something in the region of 250 cars in its entirety. So yeah. it's it's not a huge undertaking. Uh, and, and, and obviously the, the people who own them are quite well-known people. So um, it, it tended to be not too difficult to, to find them. And then if even if we couldn't find them, they would pop up at auction or pop up for sale and... And, uh, and, and at that point, you could trace them back and make sure it was the original car, and uh, uh, and obviously, uh, and just just learn the owners from 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 that. Really, have you had that thing that has happened to a couple of sort of big name Ferraris where people they own the car, then they get an exact replica made, and then like a certain point in time, you're like they they diverge, and you know then like well, which is yeah. the real one? Well, I'm sure that has happened. Um, you know, and the I mean we. You know, we've had requests at the factory to build copies of original Nobles because the the customer didn't want to to race the original yeah. car because it was so valuable, but he wanted an exact copy. And we we make sure that we obviously identify that that was the case, and uh, so everyone would knew in the know in the future that that car had been replicated. But but yeah, I mean, there's this 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 bit you, know, you get it all the time about your bits, as we call them. You know, so people use a bit of one car and a bit of another, and yeah, and, and try and pass it off as an original car. Yeah, of course, you get people like that. But you know, we've we it tends to be in in the Lister world, it's quite easy because let's say you're looking to buy a Lister, you can ask us to inspect the car, and we will be able to tell you is that car what it says it is, you know, is it, is it, is it original? Is it not? I mean, all, all the, all the original listers out there um, are, are cars that were sold. So the original list of works cars were all destroyed. Um, and, and, and all the, um, all the cars that are, that are classed as original are really cars that were sold to companies like Curie Cars or mm. uh, Cunningham or, or, or there were people in like, like that, you know, that wanted to buy a lister. So, even though they were built at Imperia, they weren't works racing cars. Um, and um, the fact the most valuable list is really the, the, the list of costing coupe. It was a one-off uh, costing that then was converted to a coupe car, and it's a very successful racing car now. And, and I think that that's, that's changed hands for upwards uh, above £2 million. But, you know, there's, there's um, um, yeah, there, there are some really unique cars uh, out there, and there's, um there's some dodgy cars but people seem to know those because when they come up for auction they, they tend to bring you know you might bring 700 800 thousand rather than rather yeah. than one or two million so yeah and presumably the internet has made this sort of thing a lot easier yeah yeah definitely definitely yeah no one's you, someone in the comments is gonna know there's always someone in the comments that knows more than <laughs> oh, the amount else. of people that may say to me oh i know brian lister you know and uh, you know I, I, I work for him, I live next door to him, I did this for him, you know, yeah, <laughs> you get it a lot, yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. With the, um, with the, the warranty stuff, I know this is like not listed, but um, how do, so who do you serve warranties, like provide warranties for? Does it end customers like someone like me or? Yeah, of course. Yeah. So we, we, uh, most of our business is direct to consumers. So if you wanted to buy a warranty for your car, if it's run out of manufacturer's warranty, it's um, uh, obviously, you know, at the moment, especially when you, you're struggling to get hold of a new car, there's a lot of people looking for warranties for cars that are over three years old or five years old, if it's a Toyota or Honda or whatever. And then um, the, um, you know, they, 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 they seek out a company like us to buy a warranty from. And then we cover. We can we can provide you cover for a, a, the same cover that you basically you had at the main dealer. So, you know, the manufacturer that you, uh, cover. So you can take the car back to the manufacturer. It's all mechanical, all electrical. Covers your rec- recoveries included, onwards travel, car hire, hotel expenses, things like that. Um, and that's a really really comprehensive cover. So we we we, we sell um, a, 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 most of our uh, sales are direct to consumer. And then the other the other side of the business is selling warranties via car dealers. So we currently deal with around three thousand car dealers who offer our warranty. So if you buy a car from, you know, whether it might be Tom Hartley or yeah. um, Grey Paul or um, you know, and, and one of the three thousand car dealers, and, and and then they can be white labeled or they can be our own warranty. So they might say, oh, there's a uh, a warranty under the name of the car dealer, or it might be a warranty wise warranty, and they will the car dealer will quite often put that on the car for you yeah. or offer you the chance to, if you, they might say, look, I'm going to give you six months warranty on this car, but would you like to buy one or two years? 
and the car dealer can sell the warranty on, onwards like that. So yeah, those, those are the two ways that you can buy a warranty wise warranty. And then say, so, I've, I've heard, I mean, all sorts of stories about everyone's always goes, okay, but if you have the manufacturer warranty, it means X. And then if you have an outside one, it might not, or like, you know, everyone's had that situation where something's broken and this could be on any, any warranty situation. You take the car in and they're like, yeah, but that's not covered. Or like that. Well, they, what, what, you've, what you've got to remember is the manufacturer's warranties are all provided by a third party warranty company like us. <laughs> right, so, yeah, that's you know, what I was going to want. Um, you know, the, there's only Nissan and Mercedes that, that provide their own warranties, uh, I, I believe. And, and all the other manufacturers are, um, use a warranty company. Um, so buying from a warranty company that's an aftermarket warranty company is exactly the same as buying from the, the letter when you get yeah. from the manufacturer. It's still, you're still buying it from a company. Uh, one's just endorsed. And, and I, the, ironically, that one tends to be more expensive because they have to pay the manufacturer for the, for right. the sale. Yeah. So it's actually cheaper to buy from a, from a third party company that's not associated with the manufacturer because you're cutting out the middleman essentially. But if you've got a three year old car or a four year old car and, and the car has got a full service history and, and, you know, you buy a warranty, there really should be nothing that you, you, you know, that goes wrong with the car that you're not covered on. The only thing the warranty doesn't cover is it doesn't cover worn out parts so if you're, if you like, let's say your clutch goes, at, yeah. you know, 90,000 miles, then that's not going to be covered because just like your brake pads wear out at, you know, 25,000, 30,000 miles, your clutch yeah. is going to wear out at 90,000 miles. You know, your water pump's going to wear out eventually. But what, what the warranty covers is parts that fail before you expect them to fail. So, you know, if, if you, if your clutch fails at 50,000 miles, let's say, then that's a perfectly reasonable request that, that should be covered okay. because it's, it's failed before it wears out. That's the thing that, that people struggle with, with aftermarket warranties. It's, it's like, it's like, I always say it's like a house insurance company. You know, if you, if you buy a house and you've got carpet in your hallway and you walk on the carpet and your five kids and, and your wife and, and every day for 10 years and the carpet becomes threadbare, you can't ring up direct line and yeah. say, well, please, can I have a new carpet? Because my carpet's, you know, gone, gone the threadbare. You've just used it so much that now it's worn out. And cars and mechanical items, there's 10,000 parts in a car. Uh, eventually, you know, the car is going to wear out. So, I mean, if you've got a high mileage car um, where you should, you know, obviously engines don't really, you know, they, they take quite a while to wear out. You know, an engine might take yeah. 200,000 miles to wear out. A gearbox might take a long time. But there's a lot of things like, Clutches in particular is, is, is a famous one where they will only last a certain amount of time. And, you know, it's if they break before that period, then then absolutely that's covered. But if they break when they've just worn out, then that's when they're not covered. But that's that's the that's the problem with coming out. I, I've had a lot of cars where, you know, I've, I've had claims uh, for all sorts of things, you know, be, while the car is relatively low mileage. So like, a, you know, I drive a, a Range Rover most of the time. Mm. And, you know, it's done 40,000 miles and I've had 16 claims, you know, so it's like this because it's just, just things that are going wrong because unfortunately the car is unreliable. Um, you know, but that's just part, part of the course, isn't it? You know, the, um, you know, it could be a water pump. It could be, I've had a turbo charger going in. I've had, I've had two turbos actually. I've had intercooler, I've had electrical, but I mean, I've just had a new wiring loom on a BMW that I've got as well. So I mean, there, there are all sorts of things can can happen to a car that that, that goes wrong before the item wears out, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and does go wrong. And and unfortunately now, so I mean, I, I didn't realize this, but I've got a I've got a three year old BMW, and uh, I took it for service to an independent garage because I didn't really want to pay the yeah. BMW rates. And they said, oh, "I'm sorry, we can't service it because you know we haven't got the technology, we haven't got the computer to tell the car that it's been serviced." Right. And BMW haven't released that yet, so you've got to go back to the main dealer. <laughs> I mean, and that's just so clever, isn't it, of BMW, really? Yeah. Um, so I had to take it back to the BMW garage and then obviously pay, you know, quite a lot of money for my service. But uh, it's, um, you know, it, it's it's always, uh, uh, and that, that's the problem with the electric cars, you know, the, there's no independence. And unfortunately, independents are having a tougher and tougher time because um, the manufacturers are less less wanting to release the 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 software that you need to be able to plug the car into the OBD2 yeah. center to find out what's wrong with the car. And not only that, to reset it as well. And quite often now, I mean, even if you put a new battery on a modern BMW, you've got to you've got to plug the software cable in to reset the computer. Yeah. Because all the different 
um, all the different EC. I mean, I think the new Range Rover's got like something like 50 ECUs or something. You know, all the different ECUs use a different voltage. And if the battery's new or old, it like makes a like a substitution yeah. for it. So there's, there's quite, quite a lot of complexity in just changing a battery these days. Um, so, yeah, I mean, we're, we're seeing more people, if anything, that want to buy a warranty because, A, the cost of repairing the car has, has gone up, cost of labor is going up, the um, your ability to buy a new car with a manufacturer's warranty has gone down. So we see a lot of people wanting to protect um, their car against, um, you know, mechanical or electrical breakdown. Yeah, um, yeah. Because at the end of the day, you know, there's, there's very few repairs these days that, that cost less than, you know, one or two thousand pounds. You know, it's yeah. very rare that you go into a main dealer and the bill is two or three hundred pounds like you might think it's going to be. And, and sometimes that's a really a lot of money to find, isn't it? Whereas if you could just buy a warranty and it costs you forty pounds a month, and 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 you've got the peace of mind that it's covered, and then when you do come to claim, you've you've got the yeah that that peace of cover. mind is is very nice. So do you if if I was to order one for you guys, do you do an, do you inspect the car? No, we don't inspect the car. Um, we just uh, take your word for it; it's a good car. Nice. And um, you know, I think um, it's uh, it, it's it's something that you know I, I think we you know it's 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 too complicated to go around inspecting yeah. cars and. You know, it, it pushes the price of the warranty up because you've got to spend, you know, a hundred pounds on an inspector yeah. to go out, and um, you know, it's, then the person's got to find time off work to get the inspector. So it's, it's something that we thought is too much of a barrier to entry, um, and so no, we don't inspect cars. You don't have to have the car inspected. The car just has to. You have to once you buy the warranty, you've got to um, adhere to keeping your car serviced to manufacturer's recommendations. So we, we give you. Uh, an extra thousand mile leeway so if your manufacturer says you need your car servicing every twelve thousand miles you've got an extra thousand miles that you could you know go over that but if you if you go over that then then you've you know really you you've, you know you've, you've you missed that that interval um but you've just got to keep the car service to manufacturer's recommendations uh, and and as and as long as you uh, do that then there is really isn't anything that shouldn't be covered if it's not worn out um, it, it, it'll be covered by the warranty. Yeah. And then it, are there sp- specific things that like void warranty? Because that's like a classic thing that you, if someone buys a car and they're like, oh, don't do that because it'll void the warranty in your, in your entire yeah. car. Um, <laughs> I mean, uh, it, it's down to every company, isn't it? I mean, we're, we're not as strict as others. But yeah, technically, I mean, it's the same with car insurance. But technically, if you put an aftermarket set of wheels on, that voids the, the cover if you haven't told the insurance company um for your car insurance but we're we're not particularly super fussy on that because at the end of the day you know what difference is it going to have made um obviously you know you're not you're not allowed to go um uh uh, on like tracks and things like that um but we you know unless you get our permission okay so you know we have when people like so they let's say they've got a 911 gt3 on cover and they want to go around a racing track if they ring us first, we will sell them an extra cover to cover them on the track. Okay. Um, but if they don't ring us and the car blows up on the track, then you know it's not it's not yeah. what the car was really uh, should be doing. So we, you know we that that's something that's putting extra strain on the car, and therefore the warranty doesn't cover that. So um, yeah, there's not there's not a whole lot of things that, that void the cover. But yeah, I would say I would say track driving is the typical one. You know, aftermarket. Um, modifications. So, if, if you have your car chipped and you don't tell us, that potentially could cause the car to, uh, especially Mercedes. We have a lot of problems with that. People chip the Mercedes, you know, and, and um, get to try and get more power. Yeah. And, uh, and 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 we've had we've had a few problems with that. But um, if you if you tell us, then there's there's not a problem. So we how, can, you know, how does that situation work then? You say whatever. I've bought a I don't know C sixty three or something. <laughs> Um, I bought a C63 and I want to, I want to get it chipped, you know, um, you know, just, just letting you know that, that I've had the car chipped. Is there any extra cost? And, you know, the, with us, I think there's about a 250 pounds extra cost or something for, okay. to cover that, that chip, because obviously the chip, so it depends which company you've got. I mean, some companies, we actually, we, you know, we, we, we do a deal with some chip companies to cover the chip. So the, ask your chip manufacturer first, they might already have, have, have put a warranty in place to cover okay, yeah. anything that the chip causes to go wrong uh, but obviously if that's not the case and then the chip causes if your engine blows up and we and you can trace that back to that well this car had more power and therefore it was under more yeah. stress and the chip caused the engine to blow up uh, prematurely and you haven't told us that you've, your car's had a chip um 
put in, then, then obviously it's not going to be covered. Um, but yeah, it's, it's like with any insurance, really. My advice would be, don't be frightened to ring the insurance company up and tell them what you've done. You know, nobody, mm-hmm. nobody is 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 worried about you know aftermarket wheels or aftermarket bumpers. They're just worried about not being told. And as long as you tell them. Um, that what you are doing, whether it's because you've had your car chipped or whether you've had the wheels put on or you want to go on a track day, as long as you tell your insurance company or your warranty company, then, you know, you you, you shouldn't really be in any great danger. It's just a case of making sure that they know that's what you're doing. And, and I think that's a sensible thing to do is just to ring them up and say, even obviously your car insurance is void if you go on a track as well, but a lot of them do track day cover um, so that you can be insured while you're, driving around the track so it's you know it's if it's just sensible to tell them those things isn't it yeah it, ma- it makes sense and i think one of the points is like stuff if you change stuff like uh, we sort of ignore the insurance side of it but on, like a warranty side so you change the exhaust if if there's a like a reasonable knock-on effect from that modification then you might not be covered but if it's nothing related like your paint starts like rust comes through, but you fit an exhaust. You're not going to lose the warranty on the your paint, let's say. Well, it comes down to discretion in that case, doesn't it? Because legally, you're you're wrong. <laughs> so <laughs> okay, if you okay. if you uh, if you if you went if you took that argument to court and said, look, you know, I, I put an exhaust on. The terms and conditions said don't alter your car without telling us, but it hasn't really caused any problems. The, the judge is just going to say, well, no, you turned the condition said, we're okay. covering the car that you came with. And if you put an ex- aftermarket exhaust on, then that's not the same car, is it? So, um, you know, th- th- that, that argument doesn't legally work, but but th- therefore you have to rely on the, the warranty company that you're dealing with to see sense, I guess. And the way we get around that is, so everybody who buys a warranty off us, let's say you have that exact situation yeah. where you say the the... the, the the exhaust that I fitted can't possibly have caused the water pump to fail. Yeah. Um, what we do is um, if you have a decline from us at warranty wise for anything, you can uh, independently ask Quentin Wilson to review. So Quentin Wilson's our celebrity endorser and has been since 2008. You can ask him to review the, the, the warranty independently to us as a company, because Quentin is an independent person. He's got a reputation He's, um, you know, he's got a reputation to lose, I mm. should say. He's, um, he's got fantastic car knowledge. And he also has his own warranty-wise checkbook. So he can, over, he can overrule the company um, okay. if you can convince Quentin that you should be paid. So, I mean, Quentin deals with, with, with complaints like that. You know, I mean, not, not too many, thankfully, but, you know, around seven or eight complaints a month will go to Quentin in that kind of format where someone will say, look, I've had a claim declined. And I really think it should have been covered. You know, it was declined. Okay, I could understand it was declined in, in line with the terms and conditions. But how is my water pump possibly being affected yeah. by me putting an aftermarket exhaust on? And Quentin will make a decision, um, you know, on, on what, what he thinks as an independent person, whether that should be covered or not. And, and that's a way, one of the things that was important to me was that as a warranty company, we weren't a faceless company. Yeah. You know, we had we had somebody like Quentin who really did have a public persona um, that, you know, was important that, that that could make sure that consumers weren't falling foul to some, you know, little term and condition that was causing them problems. So and I think so many warranty companies didn't have that. That was why when we started uh, with Warranty Wise and, and with Quentin joined us. Quentin was so particular about the terms and conditions and what we what Quentin calls weasel words. So like it's things like consequential damage. So Quentin took that out of the cover. So as a lot of warranty companies would say, we don't cover consequential damage. So if you're the, the typical classic one is your your drive belt snaps and your your engine blows up. Yeah. Well, a, most warranty companies would say we don't cover drive belts. <laughs> you know, so un- unlucky. Whereas obviously that is just unfair. Okay, and, and, and no warranty company really covers drive belts because they're a rubber yeah. item, and, and, and rubber items aren't covered, perishable items. Um, but if you don't have a consequential damage uh, clause that means that you cover consequential damage, then what is the warranty going to do? You know, it's going to do nothing, is it? So we took out the consequential damage clause. We took out things like betterment. So betterment was, um, I mean, it's still a warranty company still have this clause and it's ridiculous. But basically, this it's a clause that says 
when you bought the warranty, your car was three years old. Therefore, your water pump was three years old or your alternator was three years old. Therefore, if we give you a new alternator now, we're making your car even better than it was when you came on risk with us. Therefore, you owe us 30 or 40 or 50 percent of the car it's cost because we're actually improving your car. <laughs> now, nearly all the warranty companies still have that clause in them, apart from warranty wise, because that was something that Quentin identified as a weasel word that was a reason why warranty companies were just trying to get out of paying yeah, yeah, claims. Yeah. So, you know, there was lots of, there was lots of really, obviously we've worked with Quentin now for whatever it is, I don't know, 12 years maybe, but there's lots of things that Quentin did early on to make the warranty on the side of the consumer. And that's when we started using the strap line, the UK's best car warranty, because it was, um, you know, it really was the UK's best car warranty. You know, it wasn't probably, or Mm. this could be, it just was the UK's best car warranty and the easiest warranty to claim on. And, you know, but, but the price had to be more expensive, of course, because we covered more. But, you know, at the end of the day, I, I always believe that people want something that, that we, we still get it today. So, uh, you know, the, the, it's been a while since I've got on the phone myself and sold warranties. But, you know, I used, we used, this used to be a common one when you were selling a, a warranty for something like a, an expensive car, like a, an M5 or an M3 or something. And someone would say, um, well, I've got a quote here from you and you're charging me £800 a year, but I've got a quote from someone else at £200 a year, you know, and, and I'd say to the customer, like, have you ever taken your M5 to a garage <laughs> for a repair? And they were like, oh, yeah, yeah. And I was like, has it ever cost like £200 or is it always cost like a grand or more? And oh, yeah, it's always over a grand. Yeah, so, so how, do you, how many M5s do you think that other company has to cover at £200 to be able to pay your claims out? You know, and once you explain that to a customer, they really realize that a cheap warranty really can't cover you. You know, it, it, you know, I've had this with large car supermarket groups that have said, we've got £17 for a car warranty, you know, but we're going to sell thousands of cars. And I say, well, you know, we can we can send your customers a, a blank book in the post if you like. <laughs> and they were like, well, what, what do you mean? You know, I said, well, it costs us like 10 quid just to send them a book with nothing in it. <laughs> you know, by the time you've paid your postage and your admin expenses, it's going to cost us 15, you know, 10, 15 pounds. So the extra two pounds, I mean, what do you want to write in for that? You know, some sort of cover for something <laughs> or other, you know, I said, might as well just be a blank book. And they, oh, well, we've got competitors saying it's going to cost us 17 pounds a car. Well, I say, well, go with them then, you know, because it's not worth no. the hassle, you know, the, the, the cover is so limited. Um, you really do want to get what you pay for, and, and um, you know it's it's we we've tried in a in a world where there's a lot of cloak and daggers in the warranty world. Um, it's getting better, but you know, especially twenty years ago when we founded the company, there was an awful lot of of of, of um, warranties that weren't worth the paper they printed on. It's getting better slowly but surely. But I'm still proud to say that ours is mm. definitely the the highest level of cover and, and that's something that we've it's, we've it's, shouted about for a long time. It's quite an interesting point you brought up well previously about just kind of getting on the phone with the warranty company. Now I've had manufacturer warranties on a bunch of cars and my GT3 RS still even ten years on is is under a manufacturer warranty just because it's it seems reasonable and it's always been worth it. And they do cover like a bit of light track use and whatever and stuff like that. But I did run into the problem of my ceramic brake discs uh, running out and they need to be changed. And Mm -hmm. to maintain that warranty, you have to fit the original OEM PCCBs, which are now 10 years old or whatever. And I don't want to fit 10 year old parts because the tech has moved on 10 years worth um, onto my car. So I would like to have that dialogue with the warranty company and say, I would like to maintain the warranty. I'm happy to pay a bit more or whatever the deal is. But I want to do this, like what would be a pretty like standard change. Um, Whereas with the, through your manufacturer or whatever, you can't call them. Um, Well, I I suppose it's a, um, you know, if you look at your manufacturer's warranty, all I would say is in the in the back terms and conditions on the back pages, I'm sure there's a there's a number for the for the warranty company themselves. Um, I think it's a tough one, that isn't it? I mean, you know, I mean, obviously, if you if it was warranty wise, I, I would you know make an exception for that because I can see your point. But I think it's sometimes 
if you are dealing with a company that is not owned by someone who is uh, car knowledgeable and you're just dealing with someone at the end of it with a computer and they type in the details, uh, the computer is just going to say no, isn't yeah. it? <laughs> so I think it's uh, it's a tough one sometimes. That I mean, it's uh, I can understand why a, why a warranty company would say no because you know the the car is no longer original or OEM. I, I totally understand that. Um, um, but I, I understand your point as well that you're actually making the car better, not worse. Uh, and really, I mean, brakes aren't really covered. I mean, yeah, I suppose, you, you know, we cover the discs, we don't cover pads. Um, you know, so I mean, it's, it's how often do you have a disc problem on a car? It's really, it's really quite rare. I suppose sometimes they crack and yeah, pretty rare, uh, you know, so it's, it, but it is quite a rare problem. Um, so it, it's just, you know, it, you know, I don't think the warranty company should have too much of a problem with that, but it's again, it's just down to individual companies. All I can say is that, you know, if, if it was with us, you know, I mean, we, we make exceptions all the time because, you know, we, we understand cars and, uh, and we understand, uh, you know, car enthusiasts and why they might want to do something or other. And, uh, uh, you know, and, and so quite often they're the best kind of customers because they're people who are really passionate about cars. They're not, you know, people yeah. who are ignorant to the, the, the service and maintenance. The worst kind of person is the person who, you know, buys a car, never services it, drives it, does, does 60,000 miles in it on the same oil, and then the car blows up and says, oh, well, I want my car paying out now. And you say, well, have you ever changed oil? And said, oh, no, I didn't realize I had to. You know, that's that's the worst kind of customer. Whereas, you you know, customers who, who look after their cars and really cherish the cars, they're the kind of people that we like because obviously they are they're trying. I mean, I, I change my oil in all my cars at 6,000 miles, whether it needs it or not, you know, so it's uh, yearly or 6,000 miles even if I've got a car that the service interval is 12,000 miles, because I just know the stats are. That's better, yeah. You change oil more regularly, your car breaks down less. It's as simple as that. Yeah, I think we've you know, there's, there's... all got those sort of friends or people we've come across that you're like, you look in their car and there's an engine warning light and you're like, how long has that light been on? Like, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> well, yeah, I, I've, I've, I had a friend who was a teacher who had a brand new Scirocco. Never ever serviced yeah. it, you know. Just I used to say, have you serviced the car? No, no, I'm still driving fine. You know, it's still driving fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, well, you know, cars like that don't don't. And I blame the leasing companies really because it was always back in the day when people wanted to pay less for their fully repairing leases, and, and car manufacturers started coming out with a twenty thousand mile um, oil change interval, which is thankfully has, has gone away now, but. That is ludicrous. You know, there is no real oil that lasts 20,000 yeah. miles. Um, you know, it's not like they've invented some sort of special super slippy oil that lasts forever. You know, it just, it just isn't. You know, oil just gets old and wears out and, and needs replacing. Um, you know, so, I mean, it's... it's um, my experience, changing your oil regularly is the most important thing you can do. And, and everything else is kind of, you know, changing your spark plugs and your air filters is going to improve your car. It's not going to necessarily make it more um you're reliable yeah I'll stop it exploding um, yeah 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 so no i mean it's uh it's just a, people who look after the cars and have a query like that i think it's you know for us we would we would make an exception but i understand why someone wouldn't so it's just it's just down to individual yeah. companies but it's, preference I that's just for me is a solid argument to get a third party warranty over a manufacturer yeah because you can have the dialogue well that's true. I mean, that's true. I mean, I, I, I think that, um, you know, one thing that I am, you know, I suppose rightly or wrongly, I, I, I put myself out there, you know, I'm, I'm on Twitter regularly. Uh, I'm on Instagram. I'm on Facebook. You know, I talk to our customers, you know, I, I'm on the forums. So whenever anybody writes, you know, I've had a problem with warranty wise or something like that, I'm on it mm. straight away. You know, I talk to the customer, I talk to the car dealer, I, I try and put the problem straight, right, straight away. You know, we're not, and we're not a company that hides, uh, that just hopes that, you know, we're, we're declining claims willy nilly and we just, you know, don't want to keep our head down. You know, I, I actively want to talk to customers who've got a problem. And, you know, I encourage uh, all our customers to, you know, I, I, you know, even, you know, we, 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 we provide cover to, you know, nearly 15,000 new customers a month now. Um, you know, and, and, and one of the common questions we get is, well, well, I've seen some negative reviews. Well, if you look at our negative reviews on, on Trustpilot, for example, we, I think last month we had nine one-star reviews, but we had hundreds and hundreds of five-star reviews. Well, out of 15,000 new customers, plus all the previous customers we've ever sold, to have nine one-star reviews, I always say, well, that's I'm really pleased with yeah, that. Yeah, you know, yeah, That's yeah. really, really good. You know, It's like a 0.01% of 
customers are unhappy. Um, you know, but I, I try really hard to try and, you know, rather than the customer just getting angry and putting something on a forum, I like to try and, you know, so you'll see my comments on forums where I've got to say, <laughs> hi, I'm the CEO of Warranty Wise. If you, if you'd like to ring me or talk about this, by all means, because quite often these days, people don't go through the complaints procedure of the company. Yeah. They just go on so- social media. And obviously the you know people who want you to do something will tweet at you, but there's quite a lot of people who don't really want you to do anything. They just want to vent. Yeah, 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 yeah. And so I think it's, you know, our duty to be a better company is to find those people and just find exactly, well, two reasons to find what's gone wrong and see if it's something that could, we could have been avoided in the future or, uh, or alternatively to try and fix the problem that the customer's mm. having so that they're, they're not so upset because the last thing anyone wants is an upset customer and especially in this day and age um, yeah. and everything. So, so they can make so, a big mess, you know. can't they? Uh, yeah. Right. Normally wrap these up with five questions. Mm-hmm. So we'll start it off. Do you have a most memorable driving trip or journey? Yes. Yeah, so when I was, um, it was New Year's Eve. Uh, I forget the year, but I had a, I was young because um, I was, um, I was still trying to buy and sell cars to make money. And I had a, a 1998, it wasn't something special, but it was a 1998 C200 Elegance model in, it was like a bright green color. And um, we, me and my friends, the only thing that was open on Christmas Eve was the casino in Manchester. So we'd all been to the casino and we came out, it was about 11 o'clock at night. And my friends used to play this game that was like, shall we go somewhere crazy? And then we'd used to set off there until someone said, no, 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 I really can't go there, you know? <laughs> so um, so someone said, shall we go to Edinburgh? And I said, uh, yeah, let's go. You know, so we set off to Edinburgh. And then we were on the M6 and I got past like Lancaster and someone said, we're not really going to Edinburgh, are we? You know, like... <laughs> I've got work the day after tomorrow. It's New Year's Day tomorrow. I've got a family meal and this, that, and this. <laughs> But no one really wanted to say that they didn't want to go. So everyone just like kind of got like, no, well, well, do you not want to go? Do you want us to turn around? He's like, oh, no, no, I'll go, I'll go. <laughs> so we ended up carrying on. And then when we got to like, I don't know where it was, uh, but closer to Scotland, the snow started coming down. I have never, still to this day, never seen snow like it. You know, you couldn't see the lanes on the motorway. It was just, it was just a white road, you know, like, two or three, you know, three, four or five inches deep. You just couldn't see anything. And, um, you know, I was just carried on <laughs> driving towards Edinburgh. And I was amazed how good this C200 was in the snow. It was really, really quite good. Maybe it's because I had, like, lots of people in the car because it was four of yeah, us. Yeah. And I had to be weighing the back suspension down and putting the uh, – making more pressure on the tyres. But anyway, we got to Edinburgh. I don't know what time it was, like 4 a.m. or something. And um, I said to this taxi driver, do you know where there's any travel lodges? And he said, uh, yeah, yeah, he said, follow me. So he drove and he, he drove us to a travel lodge because it was before sat nav uh, or, or, or I didn't have sat nav. And, um, and then, um, yeah, we, I went, I went to the, we went to the travel lodge and I said, oh, can we have like three or four rooms, whatever it was? And, and she, she said, oh, yeah, it's like whatever it was, quite expensive, like 70 or 80 pounds a night. I said, the bloody night's over now. <laughs> I said, you know, like it was, must be like cheaper anyway. So she did them for like half price. And then when we woke up, we spent the whole next day in Edinburgh, like it was all Hogmanay and everything. Yeah. It was really, really, really good. We bought kilts and things like that. But then my friend really did have to work and like <laughs> he was worried about getting back in time. So he, he just said like, I'm going to have to go now. I've got work. So he just walked up and said, so like, where are you going? He's like, oh, I'm going to get the train back. <laughs> so he got the train back and then we stayed in Edinburgh and then drove back the next day. But uh, but yeah, it was a bit of one of those like, like we, we'd done it lots of times where we'd all said, shall we go to Paris? Yeah. And then set off. And then someone had always chicken out and say, no, I can't go to Paris. I can't, I can't. And we'd have to turn around or something, you know. So we, we'd done it a lot of times, but that was the one time that actually we all went through with it and ended up in the, that's, in the that's, place. That's, that, is, that is a pretty fun and amusing yeah. idea. Yeah. And so like loads, I mean, loads of, uh, loads of like risky things that I've done, you know, like when we've been on road trips and stuff and like, you know, just like like crazy, crazy things. And, and, and you know, it's um we we were once at uh, Centre Parks in um, Penrith, and uh, you know I had this great idea that we could drive to Newcastle, uh, but I wanted to drive like the most direct route, which is like I don't and I still don't know where it is, but it's like some sort of mountain that you had to okay. go over because it was a really really high road, and the stars that we saw at the at the top were incredible. But we and, and I was I was in an old Mondeo, 
and um, nothing too exciting. But this road was getting icier and icier and icier. And uh, I was with one of my best friends called Kay, and uh, she was she'd fallen asleep because it was a long way. And uh, the, uh, one, uh, one of these corners, the car was, you know, I, we were, because the road was twisted, but I was I was trying to go quite fast because yeah. I was like bored of driving. I wanted to get there, and and uh, then one of the corners came, and I tried to break, but there was just sheet ice, and we were just sliding at like thirty miles an hour to the edge of this cliff, and it was literally a sheer drop <laughs> off the cliff. And I put and I, I put my arm across like here because I thought we're just gonna go yeah. off this cliff, you know. And then literally, I'm not even joking you, like a foot before the end of the, the drop, there was just some traction somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, and the car just like just like veered to the left and we just missed it. But I stopped Ooh. and, you know, and like, oh, it's, it's, all, it's all shaken up. And um, and I just, in case she woke up, obviously, and I said, bloody hell, or a bit worse than that. You know, we were just about to go off the edge of that cliff, <laughs> you know, and uh, yeah, but luckily we didn't. So, good, yeah. good times. If you could only yeah. drive one car for the rest of your life, unlimited value, and then you have something at 500 pounds on the side. Okay. Well, I'd definitely choose a Range Rover. You know, I like uh, I like comfort more than speed. So I, I just have yeah. a Range Rover as my main car. 500 pounds. What can I buy for 500 pounds? The sort of, well, yeah, I know. I keep, I keep, I keep coming across this. <laughs> it, it was mainly the category two was so that you could have a practical car, but it was really cheap. Um, if you want oh, to, oh, I see. So you, you'd, you'd have a GT3 RS and then have a Volvo, you know, 850 or something. If you want, yeah. Um, <laughs> although I need to yeah. now. No, I do. I do. I do it the other way around. I have a Range <laughs> Rover, and then I probably have something like a. I don't know, like probably the cheapest MGB I could find if you can still get one for 500. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Fair enough. Uh, what do you think is the most undervalued car at the moment? What should be worth? Corniches. 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 Definitely. Yeah. Corniches. I think you can buy a Corniche Coupe for 25 grand. And I think that that car, I've got two things actually to say about this. That car could be easily, easily 100 grand in another 10 years, I think. I think they are they, they are a forgotten. They, they didn't make very many of them, which is one of the biggest reasons why cars go up. I think there was 471 Corniches. That you know, they're rare. They're rare. They are coming back to being super cool. You know, everyone's got over that 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 day of the five grand silver shadows kind of gone now, and the you know I think that they are just like they are they are the car to look out for. I think the other thing is like R one two nine Mercedes. I mean, I, I love all SLs, but like an R one two nine SL, you can still buy one of them for five or six grand. I, I, they, they are just obviously going to appreciate. You know, people still uh, people love SLs. That mm. that particular car was the last car I think that Mercedes built before the accountants got hold of things at Mercedes and they're such solid cars. I've had quite a lot of them myself. I really love them. Um, but yeah, they're, they're, I mean, if you get one for six, seven grand now, it's going to be 20, 25, isn't it before too long? It's just obvious that that's going to, yeah. that, that's going to go up. Cool. Um, yeah. Oh, I think they're good, good options. Uh, most interesting car to you at the moment. What are you Googling, looking up? Interesting car that I own or? No, just, well, it doesn't no, as it, you could be you own, but like as in what are you spending your brain time thinking about or pondering? Um hmm. Well, I I, I I ponder all cars really all the time, but um, you know, I, I've I've spent a lot of time pondering all these core niches for a while. Um I just think uh uh I think you know interesting car that I ponder. Hmm. I don't know. I, I mean, I, I, I really do just love all different cars. And, and you know, I mean, I, I, I so the, I suppose the car that I've spent the last sort of 10 years looking for that I've not found that I really, really, really want. So if mm. you've got one and you're listening to this, please get in touch. But I would like an absolutely immaculate, and I mean immaculate, low mileage Volvo 240 GLT from around 80, 88, 89, or 90, or 91, uh, automatic, estate. That's what I would really love. Okay. Why do you have such a particular passion for that? So when I grew up, my mum had one. She she had a, she had one brand new, 1990 G-Reg, Volvo 240 GLT, and she had it specially built by Volvo. So she had the, she had the leather interior took out, 
because she didn't like the leather and she had the cloth interior put in. And she also had um, aircon installed, which was a really rare option in the mm. UK. Uh, and she had a few, I can't remember what they were now, a few other little options. Um, it was a really unique color, a beautiful color. The number plate was G244NFR. And um, I loved that car so much, you know, like going to school and stuff, about yeah, six, yeah, seven yeah, years yeah. old. Really, really loved it. And uh, my mom used to have overdrive on the gearbox. My mom always used to click the overdrive on her and she was going on the motorway and stuff. And like, you know, I used to just, I just had so many good memories. We used to go holiday yeah. in, in, in it and and it was so well built. And when I when I was 17 and I was learning to drive, I actually bought one as my first car, but not a GLT, a GL. Yeah. Uh, an 888 240 GL. I think I gave about 300 quid for it, but I really loved it. They had such an underrated car, those. Another car that's appreciating like mad, actually. But if I could find, there must be somebody out there that owns a Mint 240 GLT with low mileage. Everyone I ever see for sale is like 150,000 miles, yeah. and he's pretty knackered. But there must be someone out there that owns one. So that's what I would love. <laughs> and I've spent the last 10 years of my life looking for that car. It's my save search on eBay. It's my save search on like the car classic car <laughs> websites. And yeah, I just not found one yet. It'll happen. No, the thing is, those things just got driven though, didn't they? Like, it's easy to find a saloon. I've found a few saloons that have done mm. low miles, but the estate is very hard to find. But you're right, people bought them for a reason, didn't they? You might have to like restore one. <laughs> when you... I, well, I genuinely would do. I genuinely would do. You know, I, 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 if I found the right car, the, the base car, I would restore one. I, I would love to find my mum's. You know, that's, yeah, yeah that would be cool. That, that would be the one, yeah. Right, final question. Five car garage, unlimited value. Whew, five car back garage, right? Well, I would, I would love um, a 1955 300 SL Roadster. Mm. Um, they're about a million pounds. Uh, I would love a U shaped Range Rover long wheelbase uh, V8. Mm. Uh, I would like a it's going to be hard to get five cars that are right. I would like a Corniche 4, last of the line, uh, 1994 maybe, if I could find one of those. Um, I'd like what I need now. I need like a bit of a... Um, hmm. I'd probably have a... Um, um, maybe a Veyron or the mm -hmm. new uh, Chiron. Quite like those Chirons. And then I would have a Lister Costin, um, like like built to my own specification with like an extra leg room and comf like a comfort pack uh, for the road use with um, heated seats so I could drive it all year round. Nice. And a uh, tonne cover and uh, yeah, and a really beautiful like Mason's Black, something like that. Yeah. That, that sounds like a cool bunch. One thing that has come up, uh, which I've suddenly thought about, Range Rovers, right? So they, 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 whenever I ask anyone about Range Rovers, they're always like, yep, yeah, they break down. We ignore the very, very new one because you don't know yet. Break down all the time. That'll definitely problems. break down. <laughs> You've got to have, you know, it's got to be brand new and it's still going to break down. So They from, break down more when they're brand new. They're quite good when they're used. <laughs> so from a... With all this information that you have in the background of warranties and et cetera and stuff like that, um, obviously you don't you, you wouldn't get the the first three years um, unless I don't know unless you provide to the dealers. Do they break down a lot more than other cars of a similar ilk? Or yes, I mean you can't deny that even even used they do break down more. I mean we you know Range Rovers are always in the bottom ten most unreliable cars, but I always used to. You know, when I was at the Land Rover dealership and I was at the service desk, as you often are, um, and there was always someone going mental. You know, I've just spent 90 grand on this car and it's broken down. I can't believe it. And I used to say to them, like, why didn't you buy a Land Cruiser? <laughs> you know, because they don't break down. And people don't want to buy a Toyota Land Cruiser. You know, they, 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 the Range Rover is... There is no car that exists that does everything so well, I don't think. You know, it, it's... They they look great. The brand is great. The you know the 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 the, the Charles Spencer King you know kind of 
era of that design of a Range Rover. It still exists today, the design of it. And look at how many people can't design a 4x4. Yeah. Rolls-Royce can't design one. The Bentayga is hideous. You know, all the BMWs are hideous. The X7's disgusting. You know, yeah. people can't come up with a good-looking uh, 4x4 apart from Range Rover. You know, they are so good-looking. Um, they're classless. You know, you can, you can yeah. go to the Savoy or you could go to the Highlands of Scotland. You know, you can go anywhere you want in one. They've got a center. They've got an armrest, an individual armrest. Why don't more manufacturers I realize agree. that agree. is what we all want? You know, we want an armrest that we can put our left arm on while we're driving. They've got, but well, I don't like the new ones, but like mine, I've got a pre facelift one that's got real buttons. I can't stand cars that have got too much I agree. You know, screens, touch screens. This one's got a button for your heated seats. It's got buttons for your aircon. It's got a button for your heated steering wheel you know, buttons that you can just press things quickly and they come on. Why manufacturers insist on having these bloody screens that you can't get to anything, three different menus to get to something. It's just ludicrous that people think that's a good thing. Um, and they're comfortable, you know, you're, you're in an armchair, you could go to the south of France in one, you'd still be quite fresh when you got there. Yeah, seats they do are waft. Good. Seats are good, the, com- the ride's good, you know, the air suspension is, is incredible. The four-wheel drive, because you've got four-wheel drive, you're not worried about, oh, it's going to snow or it's going to rain or I need to go into this field to get this or I need to tow a trailer today or, you know, there's lots of situations or I need to go to the B&Q. They've got loads of room in the back. But there's just do, so many good they do points to a Range Rover. all of these things and they tick so many boxes and that's always why I, I've never owned one, but I've always gone, I would like a Range Rover. And the only and bad then, thing is they break they down a bit. They break down like that, that, well, if you I buy a warranty, really like you're sorted, aren't you? you? You buy a warranty and you're sorted. I mean, listen, Lexuses hardly ever make a claim. You know, we, 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 we've had a claim now, but we once had the RX 4x4 Lexus. We once had no claims ever came <laughs> in for one. And, um, but the, um, those RX 450Hs, they are supremely reliable. And, and I bought one, I, I, you know, because I'm a bit like, you know, I like to just have a go in these cars mm. and I've sold it again now, but... You know, and, and I drove it around for for about six months and I absolutely loved it. It was comfortable and it was, but it's not a Range Rover, is it? You know, <laughs> it's, 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 it's just not a Range Rover. It's not, it's not got a center of rest. You know, you don't feel super special when you turn up somewhere in it. You know, it's, you know, it, it's not, it's not as desirable. Um, you know, it's, it's a bit soulless, you know, that's the problem with reliability is with reliability, you kind of know you're always going to get there, don't you? Whereas in a Range Rover, when you go into the airport at 4am to get your flight, there's a bit of like anxiety. Am I going to make it? Am I not? You know, do I need to get a taxi? If this car breaks down the side of the road, how am I going to get to the airport? What am I going to have to do? You know, that's all a bit of excitement, isn't it? About having one. If uh, hopefully I'm really hoping with the new one that a lot of these issues are resolved. They 100% won't be. Because <laughs> <laughs> they're still made by the same people. Yeah. Um, I, don't, I don't mind that. You know, and I think everybody who owns a Range Rover doesn't really mind that. And, 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 you know, <sighs> yeah, but there's lots of people that don't own them that would own them. Uh, well, I think what's always remarkable, I always think, is, and I don't know how they do this at JLR, but the, 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 X, the XJ Jaguars, which are made in Coventry, a, a very similar switch gear, very similar mm. setup, same engines, same sat nav systems. They claim a lot less. Yeah. So why is that? Why? Why is? Why are they more reliable? You know, and, and that, that's Jaguars as a whole are very reliable. You know, we, we don't get a lot of claims for Jaguars. They're they're pretty they're pretty good as a as a brand. But 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 yeah, Land Rover unfortunately is is not. <laughs> but it's just one of those things, isn't it? I mean, it's um, you know, it's I mean, what it is. I've had a lot of Range Rovers and I've had a lot of problems with them, but I still have a Range Rover. And uh, yeah, I mean, but but if you if you worry about it, just get a warranty and then you don't need to worry about it, do you? Yeah, but I don't like breaking down. Well, they, they don't... If it broke down at home, that's fine. Yeah, I know what you mean. I mean, yeah, I mean, okay. I mean, but breaking down sometimes is a bit fun, isn't it? <laughs> like, you know, like sometimes when you... When you I, Sometimes like when you when you're really busy and like you 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 you're really frantic and you're like oh, I've got to get to this meeting or I've got to go to that meeting and I'm doing this and I'm doing that and, and I've always got a gazillion things going on. Sometimes if you if you break down and your your hands are tied and you can't get to the things you were doing, that is so liberating when you're <laughs> on the side of the road and you're like, actually the world isn't going to come to an end if I don't do these things. 
and you there's a there's a there's a sense of relief and and it's it's more it makes you more of a zen person doesn't it maybe maybe so that, <laughs> that's a that's a positive spin to put on breaking there we down. go there we go right well thank you very much for coming on the podcast no thank you very much sam i really appreciate it